Chapter 20 Jack Poor Jack's son, son Valano, truthless of Shinovar, occasionally found some things challenging about living among the eastern heathens. Their warriors were incompetent, true, but the Canaran people had advantages that were not related to their skill. Jack was undeniably Shin. His skin was lighter and smoother than that of a Canaran, his features more rounded, his nose far less prominent. Many Canarans claimed that the Shin looked like children to their eyes, an irony since the Easterners themselves were considered children by the truth. Regardless, Jack could not easily hide among them. Even with skin darkened by makeup, his features would mark him as an outsider, a Remak mixed breed, if not a full Shin. Moving among the Canarans, unnoticed, required skill and care. Fortunately, such was included in his training. His clan might not have been one of the most overtly powerful, but no Shin would dare question their effectiveness. Karathach, the Lord Puppeteer, did not hold court, for technically he was not king. Gaining private audiences with him was surprisingly difficult. He considered himself careful, but in truth he was simply pompous. He did not wish to be bothered by those he considered his inferiors. Fortunately, he was growing desperate. Jack stood quietly at the back of the small stone room, trying to ignore the sense of the stone pressing in on him. The puppeteer's audience chamber was lavish with the goods of his plunder. Sea silk, woven rugs, and woods of all variety crowded the room's occupants. Of men, there were about ten, including the puppeteer himself. The puppeteer's eye sockets seemed to droop in his head, his entire face gaunt and worried as he paced. Naden, he snapped, what of your contacts to the south? Surely Lord Renard realizes the danger of one house rising against another? One of the puppeteer's rich-clothed attendants shrugged helplessly. He cannot fight, Talshech, not with the might of his armies gathered like they are. House Devar is too powerful. Bah, the puppeteer said, waving his hand. I need answers, not excuses. How many of them are there? The scouts count over twenty thousand, Your Excellency, one of the men offered, though his numbers swell daily. Perhaps we can bribe him, a third man suggested. Make peace, a treaty? He thinks I assassinated his family, you idiot, the puppeteer snapped. The men in the room glanced at each other nervously. It was commonly held in the city that the puppeteer had indeed been behind the slaughter of the Devar family, though the thoroughness of that belief could only have been created by Avon's rumor spreaders. During his weeks in Avon's company, Jack had come to realize that Jack himself was not the only efficient man who quietly served the idiot king. There was a very soft, very exclusive underground in Baden City— an underground that understood that the puppeteer's power was fleeting, a group that served Oven as Jack did. I didn't kill them, the puppeteer insisted to his supporters, who looked unconvinced. Apparently the puppeteer had often expressed his dissatisfaction with House Devar. Jack shook his head. Among a land of heathens there were many who were nonetheless competent. The Lord Puppeteer was not one of them. The men in this room should have been his most avid supporters. If he had such little ability to persuade them, then... It didn't really matter. Baden City was doomed. Twenty thousand men camped just outside its walls. The puppeteer had barely eight thousand at his disposal. That was enough to give the invader pause before attacking the city, but it wouldn't stop him for long. Talshech's numbers were growing every day. In addition, it appeared that the Lord Puppeteer would receive no aid, whether by his own incompetence or by Avon's secret maneuverings. He had been left without allies. Once news of the Devar invasion had arrived, assumedly firm allegiances had suddenly withdrawn. Troops had failed to rally to the capital, and support had evaporated. 
While House Vedenel supposedly controlled a third of the country of Yaakoved, news of Tal Shech's invasion had isolated the house to a single city. Landlocked, with mountains at its back, there would be no escaping the trap. The puppeteer had sat, firm in his belief that support would arrive, until it had been too late. This man was doomed. That was not a question. The true puzzle was, why had Aben instigated it? The second thing the invading Talshech would do, right after killing the puppeteer, would be to execute Aben. Vadens were not like the Aleths to the north. There would be no subtlety in this seizure. Talshech was marching on the capital. He would see himself named king. Aven would die with the man he had trapped. You, the puppeteer said, pointing at Jack. Shin, what of those men you promised me? They come, Jack lied, speaking a broken dialect of Vaden. My entire clan. The puppeteer closed his eyes, exhaling in relief. Even those who had never seen a Shin fight knew that their abilities could not be matched by anything in Kanar. When will they arrive? the puppeteer asked. Soon, Jack said. You promised five thousand, the puppeteer said eagerly. Five thousand Shin swords. Yes, Jack said. My people, fine craftsmen. The puppeteer froze. Fine craftsmen? Yes, Jack said. They make swords. Bring swords to His Excellency. His Excellency's soldiers, well weaponed. The puppeteer's eyes bulged. Craftsmen! he yelled. You bring me five thousand craftsmen? No, Jack said, cocking his head. Five thousand swords. His Excellency asked for swords. We bring and sell swords. Sell? The puppeteer looked dazed. Then his rage returned. Out! he screamed, pointing. Jack adopted a look of confusion and scurried from the room in compliance. Aven was not in his rooms. Jack did not have to search long to find him, however. The guards directed him to the Vaden city walls where the idiot king stood looking out over the Devar army. The troops were scattered across the bare stones, the colors of their tents marking the presence of ten sets of lesser houses. Devar had gained allies quickly. In this heathen land, loyalty often meant only as much as the strength of one's armies. The invaders had brought with them a ten-set of the large towers the Canarans used in battle. But they would probably not be needed. City walls were almost a formality in this land— Instead of providing fortifications, they often simply hampered one's shard-bearers. With a well-executed strike against the city gate, Talshech's own shard-bearers would quickly slice their way through the wood. Even without blades, the heathens' profane use of the sacred arts could change the gate or even the walls into water or air to allow passage. In Kanar, sieges did not last very long. You have returned early, Ava noted as Jack approached. The king was alone. His guards stood a short distance away, well out of earshot. Jack had determined that some of them knew of their king's charade, but others obviously did not. For a man whose manipulations were so varied, Ava did an amazing job of keeping his secrets. I was forced to reveal that I was bringing no troops, Jack said and the puppeteer threw me out. Aven frowned. You played your hand early, Jack shrugged. There is no further reason to watch the man. He is a fool, and his fate is inevitable. Aven smiled. You acted impetuously, he said. Perhaps my steward is doomed. Perhaps he is not. After all, you think that I am doomed as well. Jack froze. How had he? Aven's smile deepened. Tell me of the meeting, he said, watching Jack's face carefully. The puppeteer was looking for options, he said. He kept asking members of the group if they could help, even though they had already said they could not. 
One of the members often pointed out how many troops Tal Shekh had. Fourth Lord Dinver Shenchal, Avin said quietly. He favors the fifth refrain of the returns, and the song of souls among others. Simple melodies with trite rhymes. Lord Zalachan was there, Jack continued. He was accustomed to Avin's strange interruptions. He didn't speak much. He looked more troubled than the others, but not as nervous. The Onyxius child, Avin whispered, and the ballad of the sixth return. Straightforward songs that tell stories and always explain their morals. Lord Naden was unwilling to be firm about his contacts in Rinar, Jack explained. He said that they were frightened to move against Talshech. The whisper of spring, the words of Nail Ilin, and Kanar's last dream, Avin said. Careful songs that sound sweet to the ear, hiding their complexity. Naden lies. Lord Renar will not sit and hide. He gathers his own forces. He will not come to our aid. Every day Tal Shech sits in siege of this city is another day Lord Renar has to prepare. Jack frowned. Weeks spent with Avon had not given Jack the insight he wished. He had made many assumptions about the idiot king, but they had slowly betrayed themselves. He had thought that the man was a simple thug. Now Jack was no longer certain. In truth, he was beginning to wonder at Avon's sanity. When Jack had returned from the meeting with the puppeteer, he had found Avon's room empty. There had been two more yellow songbirds on the floor, their necks crushed. Tell me, Jack son son Valano, Avon asked with a soft voice, what songs do you prefer? If there were a minstrel here now, what would you have her sing? For some reason Jack felt a chill. I don't feel like listening to music at the moment, he said. Assume you did, Avon said. What songs have you requested in the past? What songs do you hear that give you pause? His bondage would not let him lie. You will not know them. My favorite is called the Kalana Natan. Ah, Avon said. A ballad that tells a story indeed, a song of loyalty and of a warrior who dies for his clan. Jack shivered. Yes, he replied. Avon nodded, then turned back toward the army. They had arrayed themselves carefully against the slight shelter of the sloping land. Baden City was unusual in that it wasn't on a late. It was exposed to the full fury of the storms when they came. The day was hot, the air dry in Jack's throat. He had been in Kanar long enough to know that the storms would be very infrequent this time of year. When they did come, their fury would be such that it would be dangerous to be outdoors. There, Avin said, nodding toward the city gates. It has happened. Jack peered down, looking out over the camp. No force was approaching, however, and he looked back with confusion. Then he saw it. The disturbance was not on the outside, but on the inside. A man on horseback ordered the gate opened. He carried a white flag and a spear. The puppeteer would have given no order for parley, Jack said. He didn't give the order. Looking closer, Jack saw something he hadn't noticed before. There was an object sticking from the end of the messenger's spear, a head. Come, Avan ordered. We must work quickly. Sitting on his throne in the glory of the Vaden Palace, Avan looked like a king. Even as an impotent king, Avan had more wealth than any Shin clan leader. Here, in this heathen land, lords claimed to serve their people, but their expenditures and wastefulness proved otherwise. 
Often was resplendent with jewelry and gemstones, most notably diamonds, the symbol of Vedanar. Jewels had been sewn into his cloak and clothing, and his fingers glittered with rings. Watching him, it would have been impossible to know the way in which the rest of the nation regarded their king. Until he opened his mouth. We welcome you to Vaden City. The king's voice betrayed its characteristic muddled drawl, the result of a childhood spent with waning hearing, then an adulthood spent completely deaf. On top of it, Avan added a slight hesitance, a stumbling of words. Not too overt, even an idiot could be trained in what to say, but it was enough. Even to one who knew the king's secret, this man sounded like a half-wit. Third Lord Talshech was a burly man. He wore little jewelry. The massive shard blade in his hand was ornamentation enough. It was a thick curved weapon and matched his heavy set legs in build. He seemed less like a man and more like a chull in shard plate. You have freed us, Avin said. He spoke the words that were passing like a wave through the city words encouraged by the group of lords Jack had left behind with the puppeteer, the men who had killed their supposed leader and delivered his head to the invader. They hailed Talshech not as a conqueror, but as a liberator, a man who had come to cleanse the corruption from the capital. It was claimed that the entire city had been beneath the thumb of the lord puppeteer, and that he had practically kept the other nobility in bondage. Talshech stood for a moment, his eyes unreadable. His trusted shard-bearers stood behind him, arrayed as they had been as they marched through the broad doors. You have pleased the crown, Avin said. Talshech stood for a moment longer, then turned and strode from the throne room, leaving Avin alive. Jack closed his eyes, pulling back into the pillared shadows of the throne room's far corner. If Talshech had killed the idiot king, then Jack would have had an opportunity to plead for his bondstone. Another chance, perhaps, to be set free. That was not going to happen. Jack still had a master. He opened his eyes, leaving the shadows and following Avin into the dressing chamber at the side of the throne room. Avin sat patiently, waiting as attendants removed his royal jewelry. It was several minutes until they were alone and could speak freely, and Jack spent the entire time wondering. You think I should be dead, Avin said with amusement as the final attendant left. You should be, Jack said. Avin shook his head. You don't understand Lord Talshech Davar, he said. He didn't just want revenge. He wants much more. Do you realize that no one man has ever conquered all of Kanar? Yes, Jack said. They tell stories of those who have tried. Nev Wind Voice, Sadis the Sun Maker, even Jarna, who is only twenty years dead. Tashech likes those stories. He likes them very much. If he wants to conquer the eastern peninsulas, Jack said, he'll first need to be king of his own nation. He should have taken your head and your title. Avin shook his head. Lord Renar is rising to arms in the south, he said. Talshech has more troops, Jack responded, and more shard blades. He will defeat Renar. Ah, but which would he rather be? Avin said. The conquering tyrant or the dutiful subject putting down a rebellion? Vedanal gave itself to him, and his king welcomed him. He knows he can take the throne any time he wishes. If he leaves me, he can march south with the legitimacy of royal support. He will gain the allegiance of the more traditional lords those who would have resisted him as a conqueror, but will welcome him as the liberator of Veda city. He can put down Renar, then have me quietly executed. 
he becomes king not by the sword, but by consent of a loyal and loving people. Jack paused in thought. If you want to conquer the world, Avin said, you need more than armies. You need loyalty. You need both love and fear. You need to be seen as more than a man. You need to be a force, like the winds themselves. Men do not resist divinity. If every land you leave behind rises against your rule, then you will need to spend all your time squashing rebellions rather than conquering new land. He will still come for you, Jack challenged, even if what you say is true. Tarshech will need to be king. You will have to die. Avon smiled. I have another list for you, he said. These men need to be dead before Tarshech returns. You won't have much time. He will gain momentum as he marches south, especially when word of what happened here arrives. Vedans do not like to fight their kinsmen. Renar will be forced to surrender or to fight in a single battle. The longer he draws it out, a more of his supporters will join with Tarshech. A war could be over within a month's time, especially if you do your job quickly. Jack nodded and memorized the names as Avon spoke them. Chapter 21 Yasna 5 Lady Denra will support you, Shinri said, as she pulled the brush through Yasna's hair. She knows you are the reason Dalinar gave her husband leave to recruit in Pebble's Perch. Yasna nodded. That particular negotiation had required a great deal of persuasion on her part. Though Dalinar was a very noble man, he was still a lord and was loath to lose citizens to another city, even one within the same kingdom. I think you have allies in the Nevesh family as well, Shinri continued. They'll need more convincing, Yasna said. Lady Ivash is intimidated by Nanava's posturing. She'll need more assurances before she'll move on her dislike of the queen. Perhaps if I persuade Elokar to promote her cousin. The boy did very well in the Prala War. His heavy infantry squad certainly did its share of damage. Shinri nodded, continuing to brush. It's working, my lady. The women thought your return would be as a spring storm, come and gone almost without notice. Everyone assumed you would be married and gone without ever re-entering court life. That is probably what Nanava promised them, Yasna said, looking into the mirror as Shinri brushed. Anyway, Shinri continued, now they're worried that you'll regain your old influence and that Lady Nanava isn't as invincible as they assumed. I think you'll find some of your allies will begin returning. Yasna nodded to herself. It had taken continued effort during the last month, but she was determined not to let the royal court ignore her. She used what resources she had, the money from Elokar's stipend, her influence with both King and Parshan, reminders of her former power, to forge a new place for herself at court. It was going slowly, but it was working. As she brushed, Shinri idly pulled the hair away from Yasna's neck. It was at that moment that the girl's gem-studded bracelet touched Yasna's skin. Yasna gasped as the room detonated with sound. Two separate gemstones on the bracelet, jezonite and sapphire, touched at the same time, and the power of their notes assaulted her mind like screams. Each one pulled at her, a demanding set of vibrations that shook her soul, fighting with one another for her attention. Shinri's arm passed, 
the gemstones breaking contact, and all was silent again. My lady? Shinri asked with concern. Are you all right? Yes, Yasna said, shivering slightly, struggling to banish the echoes within. Please, take off your bracelet when you brush, Shinri. It caught a piece of my hair and yanked it. Oh, Shinri gasped. I'm sorry, my lady. It's all right, Yasna said, composing herself as the gemstone's cries faded in her mind. There was a knock at the door, and Shinri went to answer it. It was probably Kemnor. Yasna had sent him to Peace Home Monastery to deliver a message for her. Shinri returned a moment later, her face troubled. My lady, she said, you have a visitor. Yasna frowned. It wasn't that late. The sun had barely set, and many people would still be awake, but she had retired early to compose letters to the budding nobility in the new Aleth state of Pralir. She had instructed Kemnar to set up her audience with Ramaha for the next day. Knowing the monk, he had probably come immediately just to inconvenience her. Tell Brother Ralmaha to wait, Yasna said, rising. Ralmaha? Shinri asked. My lady, it's Lord Balanmar. Yasna paused, frowning. Balanmar? She turned, regarding herself in the mirror. She was dressed only in a sen coat, a cloak-like robe that wrapped around the chest and tied at the waist with a sash. Her hair was down, her face washed. She was in no condition to receive a male visitor. But Balinmar, the old man wouldn't visit a lady's chambers so late, unless it were important. Bring me my cloak, Yasna said. Shinri rushed to fetch the fine sea silk cloak and place it around Yasna's shoulders. It was feminine in cut, designed to hang loosely around the body and to close completely at the front. Yasna did the clasps inside, enveloping her entire body in the garment, then moved into her sitting room, seating herself in one of its stiff-backed chairs. It was no audience chamber, but at least it was better than the bedroom. She nodded to Shinri, who disappeared around the corner into the entry hallway. A moment later, she returned with the aging stormkeeper. The man leaned wizenedly on his cane, and his eyes were wrinkled with worry. Shinri hurriedly brought the man a chair, and he seated himself. What's wrong? Yasna asked. The old man sat with his cane planted before him, both hands resting on top of it. He wore a fine blue shirt beneath the cloak, and a pair of loose trousers. Finally, he reached into his cloak pocket and retrieved a rolled piece of paper. He proffered it to Yasna. You keep asking for proof, he said. Yasna paused, then reached out from beneath her cloak and accepted the paper. It was a letter, scrawled in a hasty hand. The stormkin move on your word, my lord. He who hinders you will be subdued within the month. Yasna raised an eyebrow. It's the firmest proof I've been able to discover, Balinmar said. You have heard of the Genshal? Yasna shook her head. The Genshal, the Stormkin, are a group of assassins based out of Palinar, Balinmar explained. It is whispered that they have a new patron, a very important and very rich patron. These are a very elite group, Yasna. They're only hired to do important jobs. Where did you get this? Yasna asked holding up the sheet. It's a copy, Balinmar admitted. The original is held by one of my contacts in Crossguard. I could not afford to purchase it. My lady, this message was delivered to Jezenrosh himself. Yasna grew cold. Jezenrosh hates your brother, Yasna, Balinmar said with a solemn voice. I don't know why that is. But my sources are firm. Elokar may consider my usefulness suspect, 
but I have been alive for a long, long time. Even you would be surprised at the places I have informants, men who may not like your brother, but who would do anything to see stability maintained in Alethkar. The fact that Jezenrosh has hired the Genshal was confirmed just this afternoon by four separate sources. Yasna, we can only assume the worst. Yasna sat back, thoughtful within the warmth of her cloak. Jezenrosh and my brother may have had disagreements, she said. But this? Balinmar, are you certain? My lady, Balinmar said. My facts are based on hearsay, and my worries based on conjecture. These assassins may not even exist, or if they do, it's possible Jezenrosh is using them for another purpose. But if one were going to make a ploy for the throne, now would be a good time. The kingdom is tired and weak from war, and some of the king's best supporters died on the battlefield. Even if there were suspicion of foul play at the king's death, most would be hesitant to launch into a civil war. Yasna shook her head. We don't know enough. That is why I brought this to you, instead of the king, Balinmar said. You know how to be delicate. Very well, Yasna said. I will look into it. I've an acquaintance who is somewhat close to Parshan Jezenrosh. Balinmar nodded, rising. Thank you, Yasna. Your brother is not the easiest man to like, but he is the son of Nolonarin. For that, he deserves my loyalty. Shinri, Yasna requested. See Lord Balinmar to the door, and find out if Kemnar has returned from the monastery yet. Yes, my lady, she said, escorting the aging man as he rose to leave. Yasna sat back in consternation, pondering on what the stormkeeper had said. Jezen Rosh wouldn't be the first Parshan to try and take the throne for himself. He had withdrawn from the Prala War following a serious disagreement with the king, and now he had hired a team of assassins. It did not look good. She was pleased to see Kemnar enter a few moments later, Shinri trailing behind. The short guardsman gave a quick bow. I had to wait until the break between evening services before he would see me, my lady, the man explained. But I have an audience with him tomorrow? Um, no, my lady, Kemnar said. The monk refused your invitation. What? Yasna demanded. He said he was too busy at the monastery to visit the palace, Kemnar explained. He mentioned that if you wanted to see him, he does readings from the arguments five times daily. Yasna closed her eyes, composing herself. That man! Monks were outside of traditional societal structure. Ralmacha could ignore a command from any nobleman but the king. However, after speaking with Balinmar, it was even more important that she see him. Kemnar, she said, standing. Go and tell my bearers to prepare my litter. Shinri, fetch my violet tala. My lady? Shinri asked. You're actually going to visit the monastery? Of course, Yasna replied. Evening service should just be ending. The monk will have no excuse but to make time for an old friend. Of the four Vorin monastic sects, the Order of Cavell was the most unassuming. Its members tended to focus on the common arts, teaching functional crafts, and providing care for those unable to do so for themselves. Peace Home Monastery personified this philosophy. Once one passed through the glyph-covered double gates and entered the inner courtyard, it was easy to see that this was a place of practicality and order. The stone buildings were kept clean, free of cromstone stalactites. 
The stone ground of the courtyard had been carefully leveled and smoothed, and was kept free of chips and gouges. Lanterns had been lit to stave off the evening darkness, and a small number of people trickled from the buildings, the last remnants of those who had attended the evening service. Yasna's litter caused only a moderate stir. Other litters marked the presence of a few noblemen, while the Cavell philosophy tended to attract citizens more than lords, there were still some of her colleagues who preferred its simplicity. The core theology of the four sects was the same. The difference lay in the artistic lessons they offered, and the charge, or lack thereof, for such lessons. Yasna tapped for her bearers to lower the litter. She had chosen her more lavish vehicle, the one with sea silk curtains, as opposed to wooden sides. Summer was near, and high storms were growing increasingly infrequent. The palace stormkeepers said the next one wouldn't come until the middle of the next day. Yasna climbed from the litter, composed herself, then climbed the steps to the devotion hall, the largest building in the complex. The hall displayed a bit of richness, with delicate spiral columns and numerous mosaics lining the inner hallway. Despite Cavell's humble nature, Peace Home Monastery was one of the largest buildings in Ral Aram. In the first city, even the slums were a bit ostentatious. The looks of surprise began the moment she was recognized. Monks paused in their labors, turning with amazed expressions as she swept down the tiled hallway, Kemnar and Nelshenden following behind. Citizens whispered to one another with excitement as she passed, and several lords stopped dead in their tracks, regarding her with stupefaction. Yasna kept her eyes forward, her pace unrushed, ignoring the air of curiosity. It was natural, of course. The entire city knew that it had been over a decade since Yasna was last seen inside a Vorin monastery. Before her lay a pair of open doors, emblazoned with a mysticized representation of the double eye, the twenty palin glyphs connected by lines in the shape of a sideways hourglass. She remembered the doors from her childhood, in the days just after her father had captured Ral Aram for himself. The mysterious collection of glyphs, rendered in the shape of a magnificent eye with two pupils, had always drawn her attention away from readings of the arguments. She had wondered if the eye truly was that of the Almighty, watching her, looking into her soul. It had been many years since she had last passed those doors, and even more since she had bothered to wonder about the Almighty. Lady Yasna? a surprised voice asked, as she entered the central devotion room, a large functional chamber with numerous mats for patrons to sit upon while the arguments were preached. Brother Larden, first monk of Peace Home Monastery, was young for his station, barely into his fifth decade, and had a wide, ovoid face. Yasna paused as the monk approached. Lady Yasna, the man repeated. You've missed evening service, I'm afraid. I'm not here for the service, Larden, she informed. Where is Ralmaha? Larden's face fell slightly. Oh, he's in the fourth devotion room. Yasna nodded curtly, turning toward one of the side passages. Morning service is tomorrow at dawn, Larden said hopefully behind her, his voice echoing in the large stone chamber. Yasna ignored him, continuing on her way. My lady, Nelshenden said. That was an abrupt way to treat a brother of the monastery. Larden should never have become first monk, Yasna said. He's far too smoke-tongued to be a cavell. He was only excited because he thought I might start coming to Peace Home and bring offerings with me. Nelshenden's look of disapproval did not retreat, but he kept his tongue. Perhaps he's right, Yasna acknowledged. 
Lardon did not deserve her annoyance. It was somewhat frustrating that Ralmaha could still have such an effect on her, even from a distance. That distance, however, was closing. She paused outside the fourth door in the hallway, a portal crafted of iron, bearing ten different incarnations of the Ish glyph. Glory, peace, holiness, consecration, remaking, monkhood, blessedness, piousness, dedication, and change. She pushed open the door, which swung easily on counterbalances, and walked into the small room. There was only one man inside, wearing the light brown sen coat of a monk. He stood before a group of small statues, mumbling in a low voice. He paused as the door opened, turning. Ralmacha had changed little over the last few years. His hair was beginning to thin, but he kept the curls short after monkly fashion, and so it made little difference. He had a firm aleth face, more triangular than square, that had a studious, scholarly cast to it. Lady Yasna, he said, bowing his head. Yasna folded her arms, regarding the man. Surprised, Ralmaha? By you? he asked. It hasn't been that long, Yasna. Yasna snorted quietly. Well, if your refusal to see me was a ploy to get me to visit the monastery, then it succeeded. Lady Yasna, Ralmaha said chidingly. You think I would be that transparent? I told your man why I could not meet with you at the palace. I simply have too many important duties. Yasna raised an eyebrow. Yes, she noted. You're so important to the monks that they have you saying the arguments to the prayer statues. Once he would have risen to the jibe. Now, however, Ralmaha just smiled. It is good to see you again, he said. I assume you haven't come to hear from the arguments. I need to ask you some questions, Ralmaha, Yasna said. About Jezenrosh. Ralmaha frowned slightly in confusion. He's your cousin. Yes, but he married your sister, Yasna replied. I barely even know the man, but you were a ward beneath his father. That was a long time ago. And you never get messages from your sister? Yasna asked. You never visit her? Come now, Ralmaha. You probably know Jezenrosh better than anyone outside of Crossguard. Ralmacha turned, looking past the group of prayer statues toward a mural at the back of the room. It depicted Ishar Elin, giving the gift of the oath gates to the ten kings who would eventually form a unified Roshar. All right, Yasna, Ralmacha said. I'll answer your questions, assuming you answer one for me. What? Ralmacha turned back toward her, meeting her eyes. Why did you stop believing? Yasna raised an eyebrow. You probably don't want me to answer that. And why not? Because you won't like the answer, Yasna replied. Besides, isn't it supposed to be dangerous to blaspheme inside a monastery? It isn't really blasphemy if you don't believe in the deity you're insulting. Let's just say that I found... Inconsistencies in the doctrine, Yasna said. Ralmaha raised an eyebrow. Yasna sighed, shaking her head. What are you doing here, Ralmaha? she asked. Why waste your days giving sermons to statues? You know the monastery looks down on a man who joins once past the day of his charan. They'll never let you rise in their ranks. You'll always be stuck in a corner somewhere out of sight. Ramacha's eyes flashed slightly at the comment, showing a bit of the fiery temper that hid behind the smiles. I was meant to be here. Meant to be here? she asked. You're a nobleman, Ralmaha, heir to a fifth city. You renounced your family, your duties, and your blade? For what? Not all of us can deny who we are, Yasna, Ralmaha snapped. 
Who are you to speak of duty? You, whose every day is a lie. Do not forget to whom you are speaking. Do not forget the secrets you once told me. Yasna froze, chilled as if by a sudden high storm wind. She shot a glance at Nel Shenden and Kemnar, who still stood beside the door. The two took the hint, backing from the room and closing the metal door. How dare you speak of that, she hissed. What, Ralmacha said. You haven't told your men? What of your brother? Does the king know that his beloved sister, genius of the court, shouldn't be there at all? Will you tell your husband, if that heart of yours ever allows you to marry, will you tell him he wedded an awakener? You don't know what you are talking about, Ralmacha. You have a duty, given by the Almighty, Ralmacha informed her angrily. A duty you blatantly ignore, yet you still presume to tell everyone else how they should live. You... Ralmacha trailed off, closing his eyes, breathing deeply. This is why I refused to come see you, he finally said, his voice growing soft once again. Do you realize I haven't lost my temper in two years? No yelling, no worrying what my rage will do to me and those around me. Yet five minutes with you, and it comes out again. You always did have that talent, Yasna. He looked up at her. I should not have spoken of the events of your Charan. The Almighty has given each of us many paths, and we choose our own travels. Ask your questions of me. I will answer. Yasna calmed herself, wondering at her own guilt. She'd fought with Ralmaha many times before. Their debates were some of her fondest memories. But that, however, had been in Thalana, a different time when they had both been different people. What does your brother-in-law think of the king? Yasna asked. Ralmaha eyed her. Surely you don't believe the rumors. Which rumors? Ralmaha shook his head. Jezen Rosh wishes Elokar no harm, despite what you may have heard. The Parshan is a man of passion, and he often says things he does not intend. He and I are similar in that way. There are some who think he might try and take the throne for himself, Yasna said carefully. Those who say so are either misguided or they are fools. Yasna, I grew up with Jezen Rosh. I know him like a brother. He has never liked Elokar. But there is one problem with assuming he'd seize the throne. Jezen Rosh has no ambition. He hates leadership. He is a scholar. He would have joined the Stormkeepers if he weren't heir. For a time, I thought he might renounce his throne and follow me into the monastery. Unlike me, however, he had no brothers who could inherit. No. Ruling Crossguard is bad enough in his mind. He has no desire to be king. You're certain? Yasna asked. Ralmacha nodded. I'm certain, Yasna. Jezen Rosh is no murderer, and he hates courtly politics. He married my sister because he knew she was terrible at intrigue. He loved her simplicity. Together they live, trying to ignore the rest of the kingdom as best they can. There is no danger to Elokar from Crossguard. Yasna folded her arms again, tapping her foot in frustration. Two men whose judgment she trusted had given her two polarized opinions. If she believed the wrong one, her brother could end up dead. Ralmacha knelt, regarding the collection of Nihai statues, representations of noblemen or women who for one reason or another couldn't come to regular services. They commissioned statues to stand in their place and listen to the arguments on their behalf. Ralmaha reached out, selecting one and bringing it to the front. It was crafted completely of jade, though it had probably been made of clay, then remade through awakening. 
It depicted a young woman with long hair, sitting demurely on a small pillar. This one is for you, you know, he said. Yasna blinked in surprise. What? Your mother commissioned it, he explained. Right after you left for Prala that first time. She always worried about you. She claimed the philosophies you learned in Thalana ruined you, made you an unbeliever. My mother always looked for someone to blame, Yasna said with a wave of her hand. Anyone other than her own daughter. I wonder if she ever paused to note that the same philosophies turned you into a monk. I wonder, Ralmacha agreed. Destroy it, Yasna said. I don't want it here representing me. Ralmacha looked up, surprised. Are you sure you want to do that, Yasna? Even if you don't believe, what can it hurt? Yasna shook her head. You can't even see the hypocrisy, can you? The monasteries teach that everyone needs to hear from the arguments and learn to remake their souls. Yet it lets the wealthy simply buy their way into devotion. They get all the benefits of being a pious Vorin without any of the annoyance. Very convenient. The prayer statues are a symbol, Yasna, Ralmacha said quietly. No one regards them as being equal to actual attendance. It is a metaphor, a deferential tribute given when one is away. He stood. I'll have the statue removed, but not destroyed. Perhaps someday you'll want it. Yasna raised a skeptical eyebrow. However, her response was cut off by a quick knock at the door, followed by Nalshendon pushing it open. My lady, he said, his voice urgent. What? Nalshendon stepped back, revealing an exhausted messenger. My lady, the man said, falling to one knee. You must come to the palace immediately. Yasna stepped forward. What? What is this about? The messenger looked up. Your mother, my lady. The queen is dead. Lady Azava did not look peaceful in death. The woman looked decayed, shriveled, the same as she had looked the day before, the only difference being the lack of breath. Yasna had assumed that the death would have little effect on her mood. She had known her mother's passing was near. Yet the loss she felt was a sickly pit within her. Lady Azava had always been a buffer for her daughter, even when Yasna tried to escape from the woman's shadow. The queen had been a storm of passion when alive, hardly the ideal courtly woman, but she had commanded respect nonetheless. Much of what Yasna had achieved, especially near the beginning, she had accomplished because of her mother's reputation. This woman had made Yasna strong. Without her, Yasna felt hollowly alone. In addition, the death brought other difficulties. Though she felt callous for thinking of it, the wall protecting Yasna's independence had just collapsed. Just when I was beginning to regain my feet, the thought made her even more sick. Just when I was beginning to gain acceptance into court again. Elokar sat in a chair beside their mother's bed, hands clasped before him, looking down at the body with an almost childlike expression of sorrow. Nanava stood at his side. Meridas and Balinmar stood a respectful distance behind along with several other court officials. Dalinar and his sons stood beside Yasna, their heads bowed in respect. Elokar stood. My mother has finally found peace, he said in a respectful voice. The Almighty has taken her to the dwelling. We will hold services at King's Home Monastery tomorrow. He paused, glancing at his wife. With a death? So must new life be symbolized, Elokar continued. Lady Yasna's betrothal shall be announced at the beginning of the dueling festivities. Chapter 22 Marin 5 
Marin clanked through the hallways of the Kolinar Palace looking for Orador. He found Renarin instead. The younger son was in Orador's sitting room, seated beside a table, a brush pen held in his hand. You're writing? Marin accused, aghast. Renarin looked up with surprise, then relaxed when he saw it was only Marin. He held up his sheet of paper, which was scribbled with very simple glyphs, ones that even Marin recognized. They're just numbers, Renarin defended. Men are allowed to write numbers. They are? Marin asked uncertainly. Well, Renarin hedged, merchants do it, though they usually use tallies. A lot have just started using the glyphs for convenience, though. Yes, but why do you need to write them? Marin asked, regarding the sheet of paper. He knew very little of mathematics, but some of the numbers appeared to be sequences of one sort or another. If there were any connections between the other sets of numbers, however, they were beyond him. I just like playing with numbers, Renarin said in his sheepish way, accepting the paper back. Marin shrugged. Where's Ardor? He's meeting with someone, Renarin said, nodding toward the heir's audience chamber. It's a little early to be off to sparring practice. We're not going there yet, Marin explained, setting aside his helmet, then reaching over to undo the clasp on his right gauntlet. Your brother promised to arrange for someone to read to me from the Way of Kings today. I was going to go over to Faith home to get a reading, but he said he'd arrange for a monk to come here and do it, so he could listen too. Marin frowned as he spoke, pulling off the other gauntlet, then peering inside. What's wrong? Renarin asked. The gauntlet, Marin complained, shaking it up and down for a moment, then peering inside. There's a rock or something stuck inside. It's been bothering me all day. He set the gauntlet aside with a sigh. Here, will you help me with the breastplate? Renarin rose, helping him pull off the chest piece. Then the younger son picked up Marin's gauntlet, putting it on and letting it size itself to him. You're right, Renarin said as Marin took off the rest of the armor. There is something in here. Renarin pulled off the gauntlet, picking at the inside. Marin pulled off the last boot, then sat down with a sigh. He was so tired of the awkward metal that he was almost beginning to regret the day he had saved King Elakar's life. Vasher had him training in the plate so often he felt like he wore the suit more often than he didn't. He was surprised the monk hadn't commanded him to sleep in it yet. There, Renarin said, pulling something out of the gauntlet. It was wedged underneath a layer of leather. Look. He held up something very different from the rock Marin had been expecting. A small pendant tipped with a disc-like piece of carved stone. What is it? Marin asked, reaching for the stone. Looks like jade, Renarin said. A glyph ward. As soon as Marin touched the glyph ward, the air in the room drew breath and came to life. Marin stood, frozen for a moment, the source of the strange visions suddenly manifest. Just as before, he could see the air flowing through the room, sense its motions blowing in beneath the door, seeping out through the shuttered window, and even being drawn in and out by Renarin's lungs. Tentatively, he released the glyph ward. The room returned to normal. I wonder how it got in there, Renarin was saying with a musing voice. Must have belonged to the man who tried to kill the king. A glyph ward brought with him, tucked safely in the gauntlet for protection in battle. Didn't work very well, did it? Marin touched the glyph ward again, tapping it as it hung from the string below Renarin's fingers. As soon as his fingers brushed the glyph, the air became visible again. Marin? Renarin asked, frowning. What's wrong? Touch the glyph ward, Marin said. Try it. Renarin shrugged, placing the glyph in his hand. All right. What now? You don't sense anything different? No, Renarin said. Should I? It's just a glyph ward, Marin. It doesn't work for him, Marin thought. But why? What glyph is it? Marin regarded the carved character. I'm not sure, he admitted. Looks like it's a derivative of Na. Na. 
power. Marin withdrew his hand uncertainly. What kind of strange magic was this? Glyph wards were supposed to protect against the supernatural, not foster it. And why would it work only for Marin? Do you want it? Renarin asked. Marin paused. Did he? He reached into his Senkot's side pocket, pulling out one of his mother's sewn glyph wards, one he had carried with him through battles. It was stained and dirtied, and would look silly next to his fine clothing, but his experiences earlier had taught him to at least carry it with him. He opened it up. Here, he said, drop it in this. Renarin frowned, but did as requested. Marin folded the cloth, locking the strange pendant within it, and tucked both in his pocket. And people say I'm strange, Renarin mumbled, sitting down. I— He was cut off as the door to Arador's audience chamber opened, and a man stepped out, followed by Arador. Marin didn't recognize the stranger, though he wore riding clothing, not lavish, but rich enough. Probably a minor nobleman, nineteenth or twentieth lord. The breast of his cloak bore the glyph of House Colin, but the glyph was twisted into an unfamiliar design. Arador stood for a moment, speaking to the newcomer. Who is he? Marin whispered, leaning closer to Renarin. A very distant cousin, Renarin whispered back. From Crossgard, one of Parshan Jezenrosh's couriers. Jezenrosh? Marin asked. Isn't he supposed to be dying or something? Renarin shook his head. He left the war because of sickness, but he's since recovered. Ardor gave the stranger a familial clasp on the shoulder, and the courier bowed his head, then turned and walked quickly from the room. What was that all about? Marin asked as Ardor walked over to join them. Family business, Ardor said offhandedly. He eyed Marin's shard plate sitting in a heap on the floor. More wall jumping? Marin shook his head. Basha wants me to learn how to jump up to my feet from a prone position without using my hands. Wearing shard plate, Arador asked with amusement. That's not possible. Oh, it is, Marin said. I managed to do it a couple of times. Out of how many tries, Arador asked skeptically. Five hundred or so, Marin admitted. Arador chuckled and Marin blushed. It's better than last week. Marin said. He had me jumping off the wall, landing on my feet, rolling to the ground, coming up swinging twenty times, then jogging back up the stairs, all without stopping. Five repetitions nearly killed me. This time Arador laughed out loud. Well, he said, if I ever get attacked by a wall, I'll know who to send for. I assume you're here for the king's reading? Yes. Good, Arador replied. She should arrive any moment. Marin paused. She? You said you were going to bring in a monk. Oh, did I? Ardor said innocently. Completely forgot. Marin flushed, looking down at his outfit. He was dressed in a padded Shenna undershirt and trousers, meant for use beneath armor. Both were stained with sweat from his day's exertions. By the winds, he swore, loan me something else to wear. Arador laughed, nodding toward his bedroom chambers. Marin rushed inside, selecting an outfit as he heard the outer door open and a feminine voice speak. He hurriedly changed. Arador was a tad taller than he, but the clothing fit without looking too bad. He quickly splashed some water on his face from the bin, sprinkled on a bit of scented oil on his neck, then composed himself and rejoined the others. Marin had to admit, this one was rather attractive. Thin-faced, with dark Alice hair, she was a model of noble femininity, reserved without being cold, immaculately dressed and composed. She rose when Marin entered, bowing respectfully. Arador winked his direction, and Marin resisted the urge to roll his eyes. Marin, Arador announced, let me introduce the Lady Sankal, first daughter of Lord Shanar and Mindevna. We are fortunate for this opportunity. Lady Sankal is known for her poetic voice. It is an honor, my lady, Marin said with a nod. For I as well, the lady replied. 
Please be seated. You wish to hear from the way of kings? Which section? The first, Marin requested, seating himself beside Arador on the couch. Lady Sankal waved to her companion, a younger girl, probably Sankal's ward, who bore a very thick tome. Sankal seated herself as well, opening the book in her lap. Part One, she read, The Ideal Monarch. The sovereign is not a tyrant, but a father. As the Almighty cares for his creations, so the sovereign should love and care for his people. His is a holy position, granted to him by birth from the Almighty. In the eternal eye of the Almighty, a sovereign's worth will be judged not by his acts of heroism, his great conquests, or his wealth. It will be determined by the love he earned from his people. Despite his annoyance with Arador, Marin smiled. The reading was far better than the ones he had received from the monks. Lady Sankal spoke with a melodic cadence, converting Bajardin's simple passages into a rhythmic near ballad. Her voice was sweet and relaxing, and she never stumbled over words like the monks often did. She's something, eh? Arador said quietly, nudging him. You should trust me more. Marin raised an eyebrow. I haven't forgiven you yet, he informed. Oh? Arador asked. What are you going to do? Make me jump off the wall a couple of times? No, Marin replied. But next time I'm up there, I'll do my best to make certain I fall on you. Arador chuckled to himself, leaning back and relaxing as he listened. Marin did likewise. Actually, he was rather pleased with the outcome, even if he were getting a little tired of the way of kings. He felt guilty admitting it, even to himself, but it was true. He knew the words were important, Canaran society was founded on Bajardin's philosophies. However, the writing was just so dry. Bajardin outlined his beliefs in a straightforward but dull manner. Marin had been excited the first couple of times he had received a reading, but Dalinar had recommended that Marin hear from the book at least once a week, more often when he could manage it. Even with six sections to choose from, the readings were beginning to seem very repetitive. The great and magnificent duty of the sovereign is the safety of his people. Without them he is nothing. As they provide for his sustenance, he must provide for their livelihoods. The second duty of the sovereign is the wealth of his people. He is a waged servant, and if his people do not prosper more because of his presence, then he has failed them. The book made more sense to him now that he understood that Bajardin's word sovereign didn't just refer to the king, but to anyone of noble blood. The first and fourth sections were the ones Marin found most interesting, the first because it reminded him of the heroes of the past, and the fourth because it mentioned protocol and swordplay. However, even the best sections were a little dry. Marin forced himself to continue listening to readings, however. Dalinar was right. How could he perform his duty if he didn't understand what that duty was? There was no better place to hear about the obligations of his station than through the way of kings. The truth was, however, he would much rather have been hearing from one of the great ballads. He had accidentally made the discovery. After a The Way of Kings reading, Marin had heard a monk reading from the fall of Canar in a nearby room. He had gone to investigate and had listened ravenously. It wasn't until that moment that he had realized the treasure at his disposal. There were hundreds of great epics to be heard, everything from the betrayal of Inava to the Chronicles of the Returns. Back in Stonemount, he had only been able to hear the songs known by townsfolk or passing minstrels. But now, as a lord, he could demand any of them on a whim. It had become his habit to request a reading from one of them after hearing a section out of the way of kings. Unfortunately, he wouldn't be able to sneak in any ballad reading this day. Lady Sankal marched onward through her recitation, reading about the rules by which a sovereign should decide whether or not to go to war. 
She's not married, you know, Arador whispered about three quarters of the way through the reading. Marin rolled his eyes. Why is it you insist on trying to marry me off? He hissed. You're five years older than me, and you haven't seen fit to woo a bride yet. In fact, everything I hear claims you enjoy keeping the women guessing. I'm horribly misrepresented, Arador said. It's a conspiracy among the mothers. None of them want me as a son-in-law. Marin shot his friend a suffering look. Arador was one of the most sought-after matches in Alethkar. It was commonly expected that he would be chosen as Parshan after his father died. Either way, he would inherit Kolinar, one of the most powerful cities in the kingdom. Any mother would be eager to choose him for her daughter if she thought he would agree to the match. Arador nodded toward Senkal. Her father is Lord of Basin Rock, he noted, a sixth city. And, Marin asked, that made her a sixteenth lady. And, Arador said meaningfully, she has no brothers. No brothers, Marin thought with surprise, turning to regard the woman again. She continued her reading despite the whispers. Apparently it was expected that the men would get distracted every once in a while. She looked up as she spoke, shooting him a glance and a smile, then looked back down at the book. That means her husband will inherit the city, Arador explained quietly. I'm not dense, Arador, Marin replied. Basin Rock is only a sixth city, Arador continued, but that's very respectable, all things considered. It's a tribute city to Kolinar right now, but its emerald mines are productive enough that my father has considered granting it full independence. If its lord were a relative, father could easily be persuaded to make the change. Her father is very eager to see that happen. Eager enough to marry his daughter to a former peasant? Marin asked with a frown. Don't be so quick to judge them, Marin, Arador said. Not every nobleman is like Maridas or the king. Some of us see a lorded citizen as the most honorable kind of nobleman. Listen to what Bajardin says. His entire social system is based around the idea of rewarding those who serve well. The best leaders are to be elevated, and those who deserve nobility will find it. In a way, your existence legitimizes all of us. Marin sat back thoughtfully, remaining quiet until the end of the recitation. Once it was finished, Lady Senkal modestly withdrew. It would be unseemly for her to tarry too long with men she had barely met. As she left, however, she mentioned that she would be visiting Kolinar for a period of two weeks, and that she would be pleased to return and read to them from the other sections. I think she likes you, Ardor said after the door closed. That's because she couldn't smell me, Marin said with a frown. Next time warn me when you're going to do something like that. Arador snorted. Last time I did, you found an excuse to run away and hide. Pick up your sword. It's time for training. The opal in Marin's shard blade had darkened steadily over the weeks. Marin examined the gemstone closely as he walked, peering into its graying depths. It had been about two months since the final Prelir battle, Nearly eighty days. He was getting so close. Just a few more weeks, and the blade would be his completely. He would be able to dismiss it and recall it, and all shadows of its former owner would be gone. As it was, the only remnant of the dead man was a faint outline of the glyphs running up the length of the blade. Over the weeks, the weapon had lengthened by half a foot, growing to Marin's needs. The gemstone-like indentations on the blade had melted away, instead being replaced by shifting waves that looked something like water. Marin wasn't certain why the design was appearing. He'd only seen the ocean once, when they had passed near its tip while marching to Prala. Yet he was told that the blade would know his soul better than he did, and that its ornamentations would reflect him. 
The blade had begun to curve slightly, losing its straightness. That, at least, he understood. The fighting style Vasher was teaching him relied heavily on broad swings and slashes, and had very little focus on thrusts. The weapon was growing to fit his training. The hilt had grown as well, perfect for the two-handed blows he often delivered, and the cross-guard was curving delicately, the ends growing into points. You know, Arador noted, staring at it won't make it bond any faster. Marin lowered the weapon. I'm just worried. The dueling competition is only a few days away. I guess I won't have the weapon bonded in time. You can still participate, Arador said. You'll just have to fight with the sheath on so you don't accidentally hurt anyone. That will make it awkward to fight, Marin said, assuming I even get to participate. You haven't asked him yet? Arador asked. Marin shook his head. I'm going to do it today. He's got to let you, Arador said confidently. I mean, why is he training you if not to teach you how to duel? This is a perfect opportunity to test your skills. Marin wasn't so certain. Vasher still forbade Marin from dueling with anyone besides himself and a couple of his fellow monks. Marin bid Arador farewell as they entered the monastery, making his way toward Vasher's customary corner of the courtyard. Vasher nodded to him as he approached. Today we spar again, he said simply, tossing Marin a practice sword. Marin caught the sword and fell into his stance. A few moments later, they were trading blows on the sandy ground. Marin liked to think he was getting better. After all, Vasher had finally consented to begin teaching him how to spar, rather than just making him practice swings and stances. Of course, Marin had yet to even score a hit on the older man. He tried hard as they practiced, waiting for that one chance, that one opening, when he would finally show his teacher his improvement. It had yet to come. Marin held up a hand forestallingly as the latest exchange ended. Vasher waited patiently as Marin stretched his arms, then fell back into a dueling stance. The stance was the sign, and the elder monk advanced again, kicking up sand as he approached. Marin held his weapon forward, watching carefully for the first strike, parrying it as it came. According to Vasher, most fights were won on the turn of one or two blows. However, before those blows came, there was often testing, a few tentative exchanges meant to distract one's opponent, or perhaps judge his strength. The end came in a flash. Marin parried as trained, on the defensive, trying to block or dodge all of the strikes. As usual, he wasn't left with any opportunities to attack. Vasher struck so quickly, his attacks came so rapidly, that it was all Marin could do to keep himself from being hit. This time, he blocked most of them. One blow, however, slipped through, striking him on the side of the leg. Marin grunted in pain, losing his rhythm as Vasher pressed forward, bowling over him and knocking him to the ground. Marin sighed, resting back in the sand, staring up into the darkening sky. It was completely free of clouds. During spring and fall, the sky was often cloudy, even when no high storm was approaching. During the summer, however, even a hint of rainfall was too much to expect. You keep leaving your left side open, Vasher said. You're not a spearman anymore. You don't have a shield to protect you. I trained with a spear and shield for two years, Marin replied. I can't expect to overcome my reflexes in two months. Excuses are fine until they kill you, Vasher said. Come on, we haven't been at it that long. Marin sighed, sitting up. As he did so, he felt an unfamiliar lump in his pocket. He frowned, reaching down reflexively before remembering the glyph ward he and Renarin had discovered. He glanced up at Vasher, then hesitated. It can't be evil, Marin told himself. It's a glyph ward. However, he was still uncertain. Use any advantage you have. Basher's words from before returned to him. Marin reached in his pocket as he stood, quickly unwrapping the glyph ward. He brought out the ward with a hasty motion, slipping it around his neck and tucking it beneath his shirt. The air became perceptible around him, driven by a cool breeze coursing through the valley. 
He could see it, stronger up above, blowing over the wall and dropping in upon them. Sterns, Vasher ordered. Merrin did as commanded. What kind of advantage did he expect to receive from the Glyph Ward? Being able to see the wind wasn't exactly a strong martial benefit. Vasher approached, sword held before him in a familiar, careful grip. He was cautious, discerning, perfect. He gave no clue as to his thoughts. Except... Vasher took a sharp breath. Marin saw it, saw the air get sucked through Vasher's nose, then suddenly stop. The monk was holding his breath. Marin struck even as Vasher raised his blade to attack. Marin moved in quickly beneath the man's guard. Vasher's eyes flashed with surprise, but it was too late. Marin's weapon struck Vasher on the side of the chest, causing a grunt of pain and throwing dust from the monk's clothing. The monk stumbled back, lowering his weapon. Ha! Marin said. Finally! Vasher rubbed his side, eyes thinning. You're getting too accustomed to my style, he informed. Fight the same man too long and even a novice will learn to anticipate his moves. Let's get a drink. Marin continued to smile, tempted to mention Basher's own lecture on excuses. However, now was not the time to agitate the aging monk. As they approached the water barrel, Marin carefully broached a new subject. The dueling competition is in four days, he said. So? Basher asked. Marin shrugged. I thought I might participate. Not if you want to keep learning from me, you won't, Basher said. Marin groaned, dropping his ladle into the water. Why, Vasher? Don't you understand the opportunity I'll be passing up? You already have a blade, Vasher said. The competition means nothing to you. It means everything, Marin said. How could he explain? You're a monk, Vasher. You don't understand these things. I need to participate. Show the others that I can be one of them. They still think of me as Lord Delinar's pet peasant. I need to prove myself. You're young, Vasher said, taking a drink. There will be plenty of time for you to prove yourself. Afterward, there will be plenty of time to regret doing so. Marin sighed, leaning against the barrel with a frustrated glare. I understand more than you think, Marin, Vasher said. I haven't always been a monk. Marin nodded disconsolately. Eventually he looked up, studying the grizzled monk. Vasher, I've spoken to the others. You've never taken a student, not even a peasant. None of the monks you spar with have taken students either. What made you decide to train me? Vasher replaced the ladle, then fished out the one Marin had dropped. I know something of what it is like to be a reject, he said. I understand what it is to leave one life and begin another. Marin frowned at the cryptic answer. Vasher just turned back toward their practice swords. No duels, Marin, he repeated. Come on, you've training to do. Chapter 23 Shinri 4 Painted faces stared at Shinri. She'd forgotten how disturbing that could be. She really had grown accustomed to life in Alethkar's court. Once she had joyed in the discomfort those faces had given visiting noblemen. Her younger self would have been horrified to see the woman she had become. The city of Kenadal capital of the island kingdom of Thalina, had become foreign to her once again, yet it still held a fascination for her. Shinri strolled through the city streets, her feet given a roaming freedom that was growing depressingly rare lately. For the moment, however, there was nowhere specific she had to be, no plot of yasnas to further, no ceremony she needed attend, no function that demanded her peripheral attention. She could simply stroll, looking at the pictures. The Thalans were fascinated with eyes and faces, and often exaggerated them in their murals and paintings, art forms of which they were extremely fond. Shinri barely passed a building, whether it be shop, 
government structure or simple dwelling that didn't bear at least an amateur painting on one side. Most were far from amateur, just like Aleths liked to decorate their doors with portal glyphs and carvings, the Thalans used murals and paintings as a representation of wealth and status. The more powerful a man was, or the more rich a shop's goods, the better his painting. They were especially fond of faces. Eyes peeked from overhangs and ledges, faces were emblazoned on building sides, and massive crowd scenes ran across the larger structures. Lady Yasna's history lessons had taught Shinri things that once, as a child and young adolescent, she had stubbornly ignored. Even though Thalana seemed more normal than Shinovar, it wasn't truly a Kanaran kingdom. Its people were of Inavan stock, the only ones left, now that Inava itself had been destroyed. They weren't pagans, though they had once been. Thalana had joined with the Kanaran kingdoms in their worship of the Almighty when Joson, dubbed the Voran King, had converted in the fifth epoch. Shinri reached up, brushing her fingers along a mural. Aleths preferred indistinct artistic representations, favoring form over detail, even in most sculptures. Heralds were represented as faceless warriors of divinity, and human representations rarely included more than perfunctory faces. To the Vorans, stylized pal glyphs were the only regal form of visual art, and even those were often considered secondary to poetic or musical pieces. It seemed so strange to see detail in the faces again, but it was a good sense of strangeness. The paintings, mixed with the unfamiliar Thalan architecture, made the street seem slightly off, imperfect, real. It was an alien realness, true, but it left her refreshingly calm. She felt no impulse to gather pebbles or pull at the threads of her dress, no need to mar the images she saw around her by prying free mural tiles. It was a freedom she hadn't felt since her return from Prala. Thalana was already flawed, and that was good. It was honest. So for the moment, Shinri simply walked and enjoyed the peace. Or at least, she tried to. As she strolled, she was amused to find a slight sense of urgency within her, a desire to return to Alethkar. Things were moving so quickly. Yasna's betrothal would be announced this very evening, and the queen still hadn't revealed which of the many potential suitors she intended to choose. Events in Shinri's homeland of Yakeved were coming to a head. The dramatic death of the puppeteer, followed by her cousin's subjugation of House Renar, providing unexpected twists in the dynastic upheaval. There was a thrill in all of this. She had tasted power during her visit to Vaden City, and it had awakened an understanding within her. Even as Yasna's underling, she was at the center of movements that shaped nations, much as the high storms shaped the land. And this was the duality within her. At times, Shinri was reminded of how much she disliked noble society for its falseness. The convolutions of etiquette and courtly intrigue sickened her. Yet at the same time, she felt an attraction to their puzzles and struggle for power. She moved among them with skill, enjoying the application of things Yasna had taught. She was a child of the very society her sensibilities denounced. Maybe that's why I'm so twisted, she thought wryly, holding up the sleeve of her tala and glancing at a place where she had pulled free the silvery embroidery. The red dress was pocked by tiny sewing holes, scarred patterns, showing where the embroidery had once trailed. She knew that the chambermaids were talking of her again. They constantly had to take her dresses to the tailors for re-stitching, wash hidden brush pen scrawlings off the stone walls, 
and take her furniture in for refinishing to obscure the marks Shinri cut into the wood. Maybe it wasn't simply a reaction to the court's lying perfection. Maybe it was a manifestation of her indecision. She was the one who lied, trying to pretend she belonged to the court, yet trying to remain above it at the same time. And now you go further, she thought. It had taken weeks for her to find time to come to Thalena to search for Tethran's convoy in the dock registers. She should have come sooner, for discovering the truth about the death of the man she had loved was not a thing to be delayed. Yet the maneuverings in Alethkar were so demanding. Yasna needed Shinri's help and support, in a way the entire kingdom did, for Yasna's task was the preservation of its monarch. Tethryn was distant. It had been so long since Shinri had seen him last, eight months now, and that had only been a quick visit between stages of the Prawl and War. It had been two years since they had really spent any time together, two years during which she had grown from fifteen to seventeen. It seemed like so little in the measure of epochs, but when she thought of the barely civil child she had been and compared her to the woman she had become, you must do this, she thought. You must know what happened to him, if only to resolve that section of your life. Everyone has forgotten Tethryn amidst the groanings of kingdoms and armies, but not you. This is something you must do, no matter how uncertain you are of your abilities. And, unfortunately, uncertain was an understatement of the problem. Gathering information from dock keepers was not like doing the same with Canaran noblewomen. The men she had asked so far had been unhelpful at best. She'd wanted to bring Kemnar. That had been a large part of her procrastination about coming to Thalena. In the end, she had failed. Yasna simply needed the man too much. He appeared to report his findings, but he always disappeared back into the Ral Aram underground, searching for clues about the group of assassins that sought King Elokar's life. That left Shinri on her own. Without Kemnar's skill, it quickly became obvious that the information she sought wouldn't be given to her by common workers. A Canaran noblewoman dressed in fine silks was never going to gain their trust. Such was the reason, conscious or unconscious, that her feet led her to the Thalen Palace. It was an ancient building, lined with statues on its step-like sides. The heralds were represented, of course, as were Thalen kings and heroes. Notably included, however, were the seven conquerors, there was even a statue dedicated to Jarna, the very man Dalinar Colin had killed just two decades before. The addition of the seven conquerors amongst the heroes and kings was odd. Jarna, for instance, had conquered Thalina itself before moving northward to Vedanar and finally stopping at Alethkar. Yet as she studied the statues, Shinri thought she understood why they were there. The seven men were figures of lore. They were the seven leaders who had tried and failed to unite all of Roshar under one throne. Even in Alethkar, there were numerous ballads and stories about them. Shinri turned from contemplating the statues to instead study the steps that lay before her. They were cut for a masculine stride, not for a Kanara noblewoman in Atala. Of course, most Alith women wouldn't have left their bearers and attendants back in Alithkar so they could wander the streets aimlessly like a deranged madwoman. Shinri sighed and began climbing, a slow, annoying process in the form-fitting dress. She eventually reached the top and paused by a pillar to consider her next course of action. King Amelin had been kind to her as a child, though she couldn't understand why he had suffered such an unruly girl. 
She had avoided Thelena during the last few years, as she had come to be ashamed of just how rude she had been to its noblemen and teachers. Now, however, she needed the king's aid. She would simply have to count on Amelin's patience. Perhaps he would look upon her long overdue apology with enough favor to grant her access to official dock ledgers. Shinri glanced up from her reflections. A guard at the front gate had turned and was regarding her with a curious look. He ducked into the building, then returned a brief second later with a robed stormkeeper. The scholar paused for a moment, then rushed forward hurriedly. Lady Shinri Davar? he asked, speaking the Vaden tongue with the staccato accent of a Thalen. Yes? Shinri asked, hesitantly. The man laughed. By the heralds themselves, he said with amusement. Well, I suppose Sen Krenchan did say, when looking for a lost gem, search your pockets first. We have half the palace guard wandering the city looking for you, child, and now you show up on the palace steps. Shenry paused. The king is looking for me? Of course, the stormkeeper said, waving her forward. When visiting a foreign kingdom, child, a lady of your rank might consider paying respects to the local king. It makes for good courtesy, you know. When his majesty heard you had come through the oath gate, then simply disappeared into the city without attendance and without leaving a message for him, he was most disturbed. Great, Shinri thought sickly. She put on her yasna face, however, smiling. You must take me to his majesty immediately, then, so I can apologize for my grievous oversight. That's what I'm trying to do, child, the man said, gesturing toward an approaching litter. His majesty had hoped to meet with you before his appointment at the new house. When it became obvious that locating you would prove difficult, however, he departed and left instructions for you to be brought to him at the earliest possible convenience. Shinri nodded, allowing herself to be led to the litter, then carried through the richer section of the city toward the new house. The structure looked something like a palace itself. Built after Thalen architectural ideals, it was more rounded than angular, with broad domes and plenty of wall space for murals. Once they arrived, Shinri asked her bearers to put her down, a command they followed with obvious reluctance. Yes, I know, she thought, climbing out of the litter. Women are far too precious to be allowed to walk about on their own. The winds help us. What if I should trip and fall? She followed her guide into the building and was confronted by memories. The hallways of the new house contained even more pictures than the city streets. Not a flat surface was wasted. The floors bore tile murals, the walls grand reliefs or paintings. Here, where high storms and crom were not a worry, the detail could be even more fantastic than it was on the outside. However, it wasn't the beauty itself that caused Shinri to pause, but that beauty's familiarity. She wouldn't have thought that the new house would have had such an effect on her. The building had been her home for barely a year, just before her wardship began. Yet she remembered the busy hallways, cluttered with robed stormkeepers. She remembered the quiet study rooms, their meditations broken only by her occasional spoiled remark. She remembered tutors both kindly and distracted, scholars whose studies were their passion and who had varying patience for the temperamental child who had been placed in their care. Lady Shinri? her guide asked. Shall I call for the litter? No, Shinri said, hurrying forward with a blush. Lead on. She composed her demeanor as her guide conferred quietly with a younger man waiting by the inner doors, asking after the king's location. He then led her from the main hallway. The new house was arranged in the form of expanding rectangular hallways with rooms in between. 
It didn't take long for her guide to lead her to one of the outer hallways, where Shinri found a familiar figure standing in conference with a couple of robed scholars. King Amelin was a tall man, young enough to be handsome, old enough to be distinguished. Despite the Thalen noble line's millennia-long tradition of mixing with the Canaran houses, Amelin still betrayed classical Inavan features, a round face with a short, subdued nose and chin, but predominant ears and brows. The king said something to his companions, and several left, leaving only one behind, a middle-aged stormkeeper in rich, high-ranking robes. Shinri's guide bid her wait, then scurried forward to announce her. Shinri stood quietly as Amelin looked over with surprise. The hallway fell silent, and Shinri steeled herself for royal displeasure. Your Majesty, Shinri finally said, speaking in Thalen as she bowed. Lord Keeper, she added, nodding respectfully to the king's companion. The king smiled. Little Shinri, he exclaimed, waving her forward. About time they found you. Shinri wrestled down a blush. I apologize for inconveniencing you so by my thoughtless lack of respect, your majesty, she said, walking forward with her eyes respectfully lowered. I should have announced myself to your staff immediately upon my arrival so that I could present myself as befitting etiquette. The king paused, cocking his head. Then he laughed loudly. By the winds! Such propriety! It appears that Lady Yasna has ruined you, as I worried she might. She has made a lady of me, your majesty, Shinri replied. Amelin raised an eyebrow. A lady, he laughed. Well, there are worse things to be, I suppose. Still. I can't help but remember the fiery little girl who stalked my hallways and threw books at my stormkeepers. She had such passion. There are other ways to channel passion, your majesty, Shinri said. Ones that don't involve giving the royal tutors a concussion. Amelin smiled. Oh, I didn't worry about that too much. Reports said your aim was terrible. I was twelve, Shinri said and those tomes were heavy. I still can't believe that she trailed off, flushing slightly. I do apologize for those days, your majesty. I was a foolish child who hadn't yet learned the service others were striving to do her. Amelin waved away her apology with a gesture. Here, Shinri, you remember Keeper Devi, don't you? Shinri paused studying the hefty scholar. Should I, your majesty? You should, Shinri, the stormkeeper replied. I dodged a fair number of the aforementioned heavy tomes. Shinri cocked her head, trying to place the voice. Arrowneck Rachal, she thought with sudden surprise, finally deciphering his features. By the winds... Last time I saw you, you were almost thin enough to be knocked down by a winter high storm. Lord Keeper, you've, uh, filled out. Young ladies, fill out, Shinri, the Storm Keeper replied with a chuckle. I've just become fat. His Majesty is to blame. I was never meant for administration. Amelin didn't respond to the jibe. He just smiled nodding to an attendant. Send for Zezric, if you would, he requested. Tell him we've located the Lady Shinri. The attendant nodded, dashing off. Shinri stood uncomfortably, wondering at events. Amelin still seemed to retain a fondness for her. Perhaps her petition would not go unheeded. However, this was not Vedanar, and it was not polite to discuss politics so early in a conversation. So, she turned to lighter topics. How is the new house doing, your majesty? She asked respectfully. Oh, it gets along. Perhaps too well, 
Amelin said, waving for her to walk beside him as he began to stroll down the hallway. The local first monks would have me believe my soul is in question for competing with the monasteries for noble students. Shinri nodded as they passed classrooms and libraries. The hallways of the new house scuttled with stormkeepers, all of whom bowed to the king when they passed. Shinri remembered his periodic inspections from her training days. Amelin believed strongly in the school his ancestors had created, patterned after the legendary House of Truths, and took personal interest in its development. The building was open to all, a place of deep learning and scholarship, like a monastery without the Voronism. Here, where Canaran ideals mixed with Inavan tradition, theistic values were weaker. Many even thought them perverted. However, there were some, such as Lady Yasna, who preferred the more secular learning the new house provided. Tell me, Shinri, the king said. Has your father forgiven me yet? Shinri blushed again. He has not changed his mind, your majesty. He must be rather impressed with your development lately, Amelin noted. He finally has an ideal courtly daughter. Hardly ideal, Shinri mumbled. Not like Yasna Kurlin, Amelin asked. She studied here, you know. Do you remember her, Devai? The portly stormkeeper nodded. Of course, your majesty. She was perfect, Shinri asked. Competent, Devai corrected. Too competent. Yasna Kolin couldn't just attend a class. She had to dominate it. Most of the other students hated her. A few loved her, but hateful or loving. She controlled them all. Interesting, Shinri thought. Of course she could imagine Yasna in such a situation. A lady is always in control, Shinri said out loud, quoting one of Yasna's favorite teaching phrases. Amelin snorted quietly. I think you'll find, child, that Lady Yasna's control will serve her little over the years. In the end, when she finds herself alone, perhaps she will realize that some things were never meant to be manipulated, if you'll excuse me. Shinri nodded, surprised at the bitterness in the king's words. It was not uncommon to find someone who spoke of Yasna in such a manner, but she hadn't expected to hear the tone in King Amelin's voice. Senses trained by the very woman he had just disparaged tingled at the oddity. Why does he say such things about Lady Colin? Shinri asked the no longer arrow-necked man at her side. Devai sighed, watching his king. Amelin is younger than he looks, child. His father was still alive when Lady Colin attended the new house nearly twenty years before. He had plenty of opportunity to interact with your lady. I see, Shinri said. Another one? How many hearts have you broken, Yasna? Do not let the king's history with Lady Colin weaken the import of his words, young Shinri, the scholar suggested. King Amelin is a wise man. It is difficult to love or be loved when your thoughts are focused only on manipulation, even if you sincerely seek to help through your efforts. Remember that as you join the court. Little worry there, Shinri thought. I think if you knew the truth, you'd find me not so corrupted by Yasna as your king implied. At least, Yasna seems to think I've still a ways to go. Inside the room, the stormkeepers had set down tomes and approached their king. Newly inducted acolytes and grizzled sages both looked excited as they explained their research to their liege. Amelin smiled as if interested. Several monks stood obligingly in the corner, probably to be used as readers. 
Shinri frowned at the sight of the monks. They hadn't been there when she attended the new house. Most stormkeepers ignored even the pretense of tradition, giving little thought to the customs that said men should not read. Thalina might have become Vorin in religion, but it was still separated from the mainland by a great distance. The island kingdom maintained its own perspective on rules and traditions. The monks are new, Shinri said. Devai smiled. His majesty invited them, even pays them, as a means of smoothing tempers. Do not let his humility fool you. The new house is doing well, very well. It is Thalina's primary source of income, now that the opal mines have failed. Our stormkeepers are respected across the three peninsulas. You won't find a major nobleman anywhere in Kanar who doesn't employ one. Students come from every civilized nation to learn from us. We may not be the house of truths, but we are the closest thing the world has in these times. Shinri nodded, smiling slightly, as familiar memories returned again. She could almost pretend that she was here to learn from the stormkeepers again. Perhaps it had been the opportunity to get away from her father. Or perhaps, deep within, she really had enjoyed learning. Either way, as she thought back, she remembered her days in the new house with great fondness. She had actually cried when her father arrived to take her away, explaining that there was a new treaty with Alethkar, a treaty that gave a princess of one house to be the future queen and a daughter of another to be a ward of the king's sister. The king appears to be enjoying himself, a new voice said. Shinri turned curiously at the voice. She hadn't realized that someone had approached. The form standing behind wore a black robe, an awakener. Shinri yelped slightly despite herself, backing away. The Awakener looked at her with an amused expression, regarding her with his inhuman eyes. They were unnatural eyes, without iris pupil or whites, only red, a deep, glistening red. His skin was deeply flushed as well, and the air around him rippled in a slight halo, yet there was no heat coming off his body. Who is this nervous child? the Awakener asked, turning toward Devai. Lady Shinri, of the Devar House, the Stormkeeper explained. The king mentioned her to you, I believe. The Awakener turned back toward her, and Shinri shivered. I see. He held up his hand, and Shinri could see for the first time that he held a large ruby in his hand, a hand with blood-red nails. The ruby began to glow. Shinri shied back as the crystal burst to light, floating out of the Awakener's hand, spinning in the air, and throwing shards of bright red light across the hallway. Tell me, child, the Awakener said, taking a step forward, Ruby floating before him. What do you feel? What do you hear when you touch one of the pole stones? The music? Does it come to you? Do they call to you? Shinri paled, glancing at Devai. The rotund stormkeeper did nothing to stop the creature. The hair on her arms rose and she began to shake. The Awakener couldn't do anything to her. She'd undergone the charon. She was safe. But she looked at the thing that was no longer human. Awakeners lived for hundreds of years and their art changed them, each one in a different way. They didn't think like men, for they were no longer men. And as something other than men, perhaps the rules of men did not apply to them. The ruby glistened. The creature stepped forward. Shinri's heart jumped, terror rising. I have to go. Go somewhere. Run away. The air around her seemed to darken slightly, as if the creature were sucking away the light, and Shinri felt a longing, longing. 
It was a strange and confusing emotion to fight with her fear. She wanted something. She was missing something. But what she needed, or why she should think that she needed it, was a complete mystery. Zezrik. That is enough, the king said. He stood in the doorway, having finished his conference with the scholars inside. The awakener bowed slightly, his gemstone growing dark and falling back into his hand. He stroked it idly with his thumb, unnatural eyes watching Shinri as the king approached, laying a hand on Shinri's shoulder and turning her away. Don't mind Zezrik, the king said affably. He's harmless, a little strange, but Awakeners all get that way eventually. He served my family faithfully for three centuries. Shinri glanced behind. The Awakener had turned from her and was speaking to Devai. The two followed behind as the king started walking down the hallway again. Why, Shinri began, why do you let them? You think we should set the Awakeners apart? Like you do on the mainland? Amalin asked. Sequester them? My father didn't think that was fair, considering what they do for us, and I tend to agree with him. They don't seem to mind being separated, Shinri said. They don't seem to mind being free, either, Amalin replied. Anyway, it is of little matter. I'm more interested in why, after three years away, you finally decided to return to Thalena, and why you didn't see fit to even send word to the palace. Shinri blushed. I apologize again, your majesty, she said. How much to tell him? What will I give away if he finds out I'm suspicious of Tethryn's death? The answer was simple. She couldn't give away anything, since she didn't really know anything. I didn't think to contact you, because I was distracted by other events. You may have heard that I was engaged to Tethryn Renar. The king nodded. Part of the same treaty that stole you away from us, I recall. I do mourn your loss at his death, child. I don't know if you were close to the prince or not. But I knew something of the lad. He was a good and honest man. It is a shame that he should die so tragically while traveling here, to Thalena itself, Shinri noted. The king paused slightly, eyeing her. So it begins, Shinri thought. You play the game after all, Amelin. You may be fond of the child your school once trained, but fondness and politics are completely separate things. Indeed, Amelin finally said. I didn't even know that he was coming until word of his death arrived at the palace. Really? Shinri asked, studying his face covertly, looking for signs that the king was lying. He was good at hiding his emotions for a man. Some people I've spoken to were under the impression that Prince Tethryn was coming specifically to engage in a deal with you, Your Majesty. Amelin snorted. You speak of the rumor that he was going to sell me an awakener? Tell me, Shinri. You've just seen that I value the freedom even of those who don't value it themselves. How likely do you think I would be to break Shenaris by paying money to own another man? Shinri shrugged. If you thought you were bringing him to freedom, perhaps? No, Amelin replied. A man's reputation is his life, Shinri, especially when dealing with you Kanarans. Even freeing an Awakener wouldn't be worth the chance of the Aleph and Vaden nobleman thinking me an oath-breaker. If they were to stop employing our storm-keepers... He was probably telling the truth. Amelin could bend religious traditions or gender roles, 
But no man could deny the way of kings and survive. It would be political suicide, especially considering Alethkar's rising political strength. I must admit, then, Shinri said carefully, I am confused. Tethryn was a careful planner, Your Majesty. I find it difficult to believe that he would let his entire convoy be caught in a powerful high storm, no matter what the circumstances. You wouldn't know what trade goods he was transporting, would you? What would be so important to him that he would press on instead of returning for shelter? The dock register said he was bringing a simple shipment of ceramics from the Lahanran mud shores, Amelin replied. Ah, so you have researched this, Shinri thought with satisfaction. But what is it you aren't telling me, my dear King Amelin? The cover-up was obvious in his eyes and his posture. He was nervous about something, though he kept it in check. Time to bargain. It seems that these are difficult times, no matter where one travels, she said. Indeed, Amelin replied. At least the high storms are somewhat predictable, far more so than the hearts of men. One never can tell when one's trusted ally might become a foe. He might even come to wish your death. Ah, so you've heard of the assassination plot. And he obviously wanted to hear more. Unfortunately, there was little she could offer him in good conscience. The danger to Yasna's brother was far too pressing. I'm afraid I know little of such things, Shinri said. I've been watching Yakaved lately. My family is, of course, my foremost concern. Amelin eyed her. I doubt you can have maintained much familiarity with them, though, seeing as how you've lived in Althkar for the last three years. True, she thought. So he doesn't want to hear about the Vaden dynasty change. Or at least he's correctly guessed that I don't have much to offer beyond speculation. You are correct. Shinri admitted. I have been away from the three houses for too long. However, the truth is that I spent as much of it in Prala as in Alethkar. The war itself proved very interesting, especially in its final days. Amelin paused. I am a bit curious about that, he admitted. I heard some interesting rumors. Something about the death of the traitor and the Pralir king? Shinri smiled. Bait taken. Now she just had to hope what she offered was worth whatever it was he hid. It happened during a high storm, she explained. The king was on the battlefield, fighting toward a decoy tower. The traitor led a surprise force in a flanking maneuver, sneaking toward the back of our army probably to attack our command towers, or even our camp itself. A cowardly move, Amelin noted. True, Shinri said. But so was murdering his own king, then fleeing to Prala to hide. One of our scouts noticed the approaching force, and we sent an intercepting army. However, the man who sent the intercepting force did not wait for proper estimates of troop strength or location. He ended up sending 5,000 men to face a force 20,000 strong. When the high storm passed, King Elokar led a larger force to intercept. However, he found both armies, the traitor's force and the smaller Alith contingent, dead. Curious, Amelin said with a troubled look. They fought during the high storm? Apparently, Shinri said. But later analysis led Lord Dalinar to believe that there was a third force involved, one that killed both groups of men under the cover of the storm, then left the bodies as if they had killed each other. This caused Amelin to frown openly. 
That is very strange, he said. Lord Dalinar thinks the third force came up from distant Prawl, Shinri explained. The wild lands there are just a short distance away, and there are numerous malcontents there who were unhappy with Prelir and its king. But why kill the Aleth force too? Amelin asked. It seems very unusual. It has given Lord Dalinar a great deal of worry, Shinri agreed. He is seeking information about who could have raised an army large enough to defeat over 20,000 soldiers in the space of a high storm's passing. He thinks it might be a group known as the Ranta, a collection of former Prelir noblemen who were ousted during the conflicts a decade back. I'm afraid I know little more than that. Amelin nodded thoughtfully. Then he studied Shinri again, his eyes betraying a measure of respect. Even considering her changes in behavior, he obviously hadn't expected to find a political adept in the place of the outrageous child he had known. You're very observant, he noted. Lady Yasna trained you well. Thank you, Your Majesty, Shinri said. Of course, she also trained me to expect those treated with kindness to respond in turn. You're already better than she is, Amelin said with a chuckle. That's always been her problem, Shinri. She can't laugh about these things, even slightly. Everything is so serious to her. The mighty, stoic, unyielding Lady Yasna Kulin. Sometimes a man doesn't want strength. He just wants a smile. I saw her smile once, Shinri noted. At least, I think I did. It might have been a nervous twitch. Or perhaps she was just stifling a sneeze. Amelin laughed deeply, shaking his head. That woman. I certainly hope that her future husband is a man of sturdy patience. The betrothal is to be announced this evening, is it not? Yes, Shenry said. At the dueling competition. Amelin nodded. He took a breath, sobering slightly. All right, on with the response in turn, then. You're right to suspect Tethryn's death, child. However, I think you're seeking answers to the wrong questions. The cargo of that convoy is irrelevant. Rather than asking what the ships were carrying, you should be asking what they weren't. What they weren't carrying? Shinri repeated. What do you mean? Your Prince Tethryn wasn't aboard any of those ships, Amelin said quietly. Shinri paused in the hallway, stunned. Stupid? You didn't even consider that. What of Yasna's training now? How could you miss something so obvious? The Renars threw that convoy together with such speed that it was obvious they were trying to hide something, Amelin explained. I was fortunate to have a very clever spy in the port they chose to depart from, and he got himself on board one of the convoy vessels, Shinri. They sunk that ship themselves. They sailed out, knowing ahead of time that they would get caught in the storm. They tried to make it look as realistic as possible, so the sailors would spread the rumor they wanted. But my spy went out during the storm itself, the Renars scuttled their own ship, leaving it to sink in the storm. Scuttled their own ship? They wanted it to look like Tethryn was dead, she said. But why? So they could use him as a spy somehow? Amelin shook his head. House Renar is convinced he is dead, he said. The sinking of the ship was to cover something else. Something about the way he died, though I can't figure out what. They needed a convenient excuse for a prince of one of the three houses to just suddenly disappear. 
A sickness would have been far less suspicious, Shinri said. Why use such a contrived method? They would have been expected to display a body if he'd died of a sickness, Amelin pointed out. True, Shinri said. But even still, I came seeking answers, your majesty. But what you've given me only makes me more curious. Amelin paused, shooting a look behind to where his attendant stood with the awakener and head stormkeeper. He turned back to her. This is a difficult subject, Shinri. I don't know what happened to Tethran, but the Renar are determined to keep it secret. You might not want to push too hard on this one. I doubt the reward is going to be worth the cost. Perhaps, Shinri said skeptically. Amelin shook his head. The Renar sinking their own ships? The Devar rising up to take the Vaden throne? Alath Parshan hiring assassins to kill their own king? Times have grown uncertain, Shinri. I don't trust the world anymore, not beyond my own shores. I'm going to try to keep Thalina secure during the days to follow. You are welcome here, if you wish to remain. Shinri paused. I don't understand, your majesty. Refuge, Shinri, Amelin said quietly. It will be a difficult thing to find in the near future, I think. Why don't you stay in Thalina for a while? I'll send a message to Lady Colin. Your period of wardship has to be nearing an end, and she is going to be wedded in a few days. She will be too busy to see to your training. Perhaps she'll let you stay here receive some of the teachings at the new house that you once avoided. Refuge. But what he offered was more politics. Did he ask out of concern for her, or out of desire to have leverage against both Lady Yasna and Lord Talshech Davar? No, she told herself. You can trust this man. But she couldn't stay, anyway. Not now, your majesty, she said, shaking her head. Lady Yasna needs me too much right now. Besides, I need to know what happened to Tethryn. He wasn't on the ship. Your spies say that the Renars think him dead. But what if... It was a frightening thought. She'd loved him once, as a child. What would she think of him now? Besides, she said out loud, I think you may be overreacting. The issue with Jezenrosh is dangerous, perhaps, but it will soon be resolved. There may be conflict ahead, but it will be nothing compared to what we already endured in Prala. Alethkar won that war with ease. It can overcome a few internal squabbles. Ah, child, the king replied. The Prala War was but a breeze to the high storm that is coming, and most houses aren't ready for it. Their glyph wards aren't out, and their windows are open. Destruction will come with the winds. Shinri frowned, looking up at the kindly man who had welcomed her as a child and would now do the same for her again. How could she explain? If there was a storm coming, then Shinri needed to spend it at Yasna's side. Yasna frustrated her. Others saw the woman as heartless, and at times Shinri agreed. Yasna was never complimentary, ever critical, and always manipulative. But Yasna was the only one who had been able to take the child Shinri and give her the gifts of propriety and education. Only a will that powerful a temperament that unprovocable had been strong enough to make Shinri change. After the death of Shinri's mother, so long before. The truth was, Yasna was really all she had, all she had ever had. I must go back, she said. The king sighed, standing. Very well, he said. Just watch yourself. 
once little Shinri. Dangerous times are approaching. Our oath gate may not be open in the coming months, but if you can find your way here, I will provide what safety I can. Thank you, Your Majesty. Amelin stood, watching the young girl leave down the hallway, heading for the oath gate. He shook his head. It was already beginning. First Vadenar with the War of the Houses, and soon Alethkar. The world was changing. He turned to his companions. Well? Red-eyed Zezric shook his head. She is no awakener. She scents nothing of the melody, and she wears her jewelry without regard, without love. Amelin nodded. That had been his last guess, though it had been a far-fetched one. Still, perhaps not an awakener, but she's of the right age and of one of the right lines. So are a lot of people, Devi said. We tested her when she was here four years ago, Your Majesty. There is nothing unusual about the child. Yes, Amelin said. But so much had been lost with the fall of the House of Truths, and there were things for which they knew no tests. Very well. What of her purpose here in Thalana? Do you think she was spying for Yasna or for her cousin Tarshech Devar? Hard to say, Your Majesty, Devi said. Did she give any hints to you? Amelin shook his head. She covered herself well. She implied she was here to investigate the death of Prince Tethran of House Rinar. It is a good story, perhaps even the truth. She was engaged to the man, after all. A political betrothal, Devi said, made when she was just fourteen. She came through the oath gate furtively, without announcement or notice to you, then entered the city without attendants or litter-bearers. That is very suspicious behavior. Do you think the Aleth might suspect what we do? Amelin shook his head. I don't know, he admitted. There might be a few onyx seers in Yakoved, but Alethkar? We have heard nothing. Which could mean that their security is even greater than our own. A frightening thought. Come, Amelin said. We have preparations to make. Chapter 24 Town 5 This one's different, Lon, Sapphire Jan said, leaning against his staff as he watched the muscular madman work. Jan had been foreman of the first city's crumb cleaners for going on twenty years, and he had seen many types of men. So many, in fact, he'd assumed he knew just about every type of worker the Almighty could provide. It appeared that he had been wrong. Brother Lon turned with an unconcerned eye, rising from his work on a building's wall to regard Tuln. The supposed madman worked with fastidious care, chipping crumbstone off of a stone way marker. Even from the first day the man's work had been perfect— Every corner and crack cleaned, no hint of sloppiness. Sapphire Jan had seen that before. Men that fastidious, however, also tended to be shy. Quiet types who never spent time talking with the other workers. Even if they were more outgoing, their quick, efficient work quickly ostracized them from the others who didn't like being made to seem lazy. This man was different. Jan's eyes narrowed as he watched Tom smile at a passing worker, exchanging pleasantries and a joke, then go back to his work. What do you mean, Jan? Lon said. Look at him, Jan said. Look at the way he works. He's not like the other ones you've brought me. He actually does the job. There's nothing wrong with the workers I provide, the husky monk informed. Now don't get huffy, Jan said with a snort. I don't mind helping out a man of the Almighty, 
I could use a few good deeds under my cloak. I'm never displeased when you bring by one of your projects. I just expect them to need some uh, extra supervision. This one, he almost doesn't seem crazy. Almost, Lon said, dusting off his gloves, which were covered with rock chips. Whenever the monk brought a new worker, he always spent the first few months working the streets as well. Lon claimed he wanted to get away from the monastery, but Sapphire Jan saw the gentle patience in the monk's attentiveness. His wards were rarely the best workers, though not through fault of laziness. They just tended to get distracted or be a bit slow. With Lon's guidance, however, they usually found a place among the crom cleaners. Are you sure he's... Uh, Jan asked. I mean... He just doesn't talk like the others, or even look like them. He seems like a regular man and a good one at that. He does four times the work of my best worker, never seems to need to rest, never makes a mistake in his cleaning, and is easily the best-liked man on the team. Lon shook his head. I wasn't certain at first either, he admitted. But <laughs> you've heard him talk. Sapphire Jan nodded. He had indeed. In fact, that was the problem. The only problem. A lot of the men on his teams weren't the brightest gems in the pile. They were foreigners who hadn't come from civilized lands, or men who couldn't get jobs as craftsmen or servants. When Taln had first started talking, the men had laughed. Now, however, well, Sapphire Jan could see the looks in their eyes— before long the madman would have the entire team believing he was some kind of heavenly servant. I don't like it, Lan, Jan admitted. I'm sorry to the Almighty, but I just don't like it. You brought me men who wander off in the middle of their shift, men who sit and clean the same patch of stonework for hours and hours without looking up, and men who never say a word, just stare into space. I never worried about any of them. This one, he could be trouble. I even find myself half believe in him. If he ever wanted to cause trouble, I worry that these poor lads would listen to him. Jan clenched his jaw in thought. He'd earned the nickname Sapphire early in his career. The stories gave all the Polestones personalities, and Jan was most certainly a Sapphire, stubborn, demanding, and in charge. He has to go, Brother Lan, he decided, fingering his glyph ward and hoping the Almighty would forgive him. If he could learn to be quiet, it'd be different. But we both know he won't ever stop this nonsense about the return. I can't have the man on my team. I'm sorry. Lon nodded. That's all right, Jan. I'll just have to find another place for him. Sapphire Jan shook his head, turning away as the monk removed his gloves and wandered over toward the working town. In three thousand years of life, there were relatively few things that Taln had not tried. Crom cleaning, interestingly, was one of them. He knelt on the stone, using a small metal tool to clean the crusty crom stone out of the carved cracks of a waystone a street marker that gave directions to various parts of the city. Crumb cleaning was a curious sign of the three peninsulas. The Ilin had been surprised by the lack of crumb on buildings when they had come for the first return. They had assumed that people would just let it build up. That, however, had been long, long ago. Tallon shook his head, using the edge of his tool to scrape the softer crumb stone from the granite etchings. He barely even remembered what it was like to live in a land where the rains didn't drop muck that eventually hardened to stone. Crom could be cleaned off with ease. His own problems were not so easy to repair. It was not easy for him to remain quiet. The Khothen were coming, and something was very wrong. Apelian sourcing didn't work, not even his own. This time there would be no windrunners or stone wards to respond to the demonic assault. 
Mankind stood on the brink of its own destruction, and no one even realized it. Except Tom. And presumably the other heralds, but they had yet to arrive. Tom had not spent the last few weeks in idleness despite his attempts to remain out of trouble. He had befriended the keepers of bars, listening to stories of travelers searching desperately for some hint of his brethren. Though he no longer had access to the library, he had his one book, and he had studied its every page a ten set times over. He had interrogated every old gaffer who would speak with him, absorbing as much of the recent history as he could. He had heard of the coming of Jarna, who had nearly conquered the world before being slain by Dalinor the Tyrant Bane. Tone had heard of the wars in Prala, and had gathered everything he could on the various kings of the various nations. He could do no more in Alethkar. Here he was considered a madman. He needed to move on, to use his newfound information to make a better, hopefully more sane, impression on another kingdom's monarch. There was still hope for Roshar, even if his brethren failed to arrive. However, there was one thing he wanted to do first. Lon approached with his customary unhurried gait. Tom wasn't certain if the monk didn't trust him or if he was just concerned for Tom's mental health. But Lon hadn't left him alone a single day out of the last two weeks. Despite numerous complaints about how much he loathed crumb cleaning, the monk had gotten down and scrubbed walls like a man who'd been doing the work all his life. Tom rose, dusting off his gloves as the monk approached. You requested that we be allowed to leave early? You could say that, Lon replied. Good, Tom said with a nod, setting aside his tool and gloves. It was growing late in the day, and the sun was just a few hours away from setting behind the monstrous peak of the Mount of Ancestors. We need to get cleaned up, Tom said. The duels will begin soon. Lead on, then, Herald of the Almighty, Lon said, waving toward the monastery. Though why you want to go watch is beyond me. I know a couple good games of chips we could get in on. Tom smiled. Every day the monk, like everyone else, got wages from the crumb cleaning. Lon probably should have turned his earnings in to his superiors, since monks couldn't own wealth. Lon, however, promptly took the gems and lost them in nightly gambling games with the other crom cleaners. He'd once told Tom that he figured the money would get to the poor of the city one way or another, and he might as well have fun giving it to them. He never seemed to wonder what would happen if he won. Fortunately, Lon was absolutely terrible at chips. No chips tonight, Lon, Tom replied. You have a promise to keep... Lon rolled his eyes. I can tell you what's going to happen, the monk informed. Some men are going to pretend to try and hurt each other with swords. They'll hop around a bit and one of them will strike a lucky blow. They'll stop, congratulate each other for being so magnificent, and then they'll go get drunk. There will be a lot of lords there and they'll all do their best to make the rest of us feel like we don't belong. It will be crowded, smelly, and melodramatic. A good game of chips, however. Tone shook his head. You said if I worked on the streets you would get me into the duels. Lon sighed. All right. Since we're citizens, we'll only be able to watch the lesser duels, of course. Of course. Lon paused. After the duels, we need to have a talk about uh, issues of employment. If you wish, Tone said. Sapphire Jan had been a good foreman, and Lon had worked hard to provide Tone with a stable life. Tone was grateful to both of them. However, neither of them knew that Tone had no intention whatsoever of cleaning walls the next day, even if he did survive the night's festivities. Chapter 25 Yasna 6 the feast hall fell silent as Yasna entered. The quiet was eerie. The competition should have been a time of mirth and celebration, not one of solemnity. 
titles would be presented, honor and prestige would be earned, old acquaintances could be rekindled, and old rivalries inflamed. Yet, at Yasna's entrance, the women suddenly fell silent. The men, sensing the mood, trailed off as well. Yasna tried to ignore the onlookers as she walked forward with a smooth gait. The variety in kingdoms represented at the feast was surprising. Thalen and Vaden visitors were to be expected. Both kingdoms were powerful in their own right and were allies of Alethkar. However, there were also would-be noblemen from the struggling kingdoms of distant Prahl, conquered aristocrats from the occupied kingdom of Lachenron, and even a few Shin clansmen. For the festivities, Elokar had chosen the Jez Hall, the Eleventh Hall, as it was called, built not for a single kingdom, but to accommodate a larger mixed group. It was wide and open, its support columns relegated to the outer rim, with four massive pillars running down the center of the chamber. A dueling ring had been drawn between each set of pillars, with tables forming layered circles around them. There would be other dueling rings, of course, in lesser feast halls, attended by citizens and less important nobility. The preliminary duels had already been performed. Only the very best of contestants would perform before the king. Yasna walked through the room, maintaining an elegant stride, Tala blue, hair up, looking as regal as she ever had. While Elokar had thought to keep the betrothal announcement a relative secret, Nanava had seen to it that every woman in the court knew exactly what was going to happen. And what a man's wife knew, he knew. The men watched respectfully as Yasna passed, pleasantly oblivious to the truth. To them, the betrothal announcement marked the joyous and long overdue marriage of the king's aging sister. Their wives, however, knew better. The women of the court smiled with false eyes. Those with enough sense to pay attention realized that no wedding would be announced this day, but a funeral the death of Yasna's political career. Yasna's struggle with the queen had been unseen, even unmentioned, but it had been as fervent as any battlefield war. Nanava sat at the queen's table, almost demure in her red tala, resplendent with sapphires. She had won. As Yasna's closest married female kin and surrogate mother, Nanava had the right to choose Yasna's husband. She could choose practically anyone, provided the match wasn't too unequal. However, there were plenty of lords of modest rank who lived far, far from oath gates or courts. It would not be difficult to find Yasna a man with little interest in politics, one who lived in a city so secluded from important events that Yasna would have difficulty discovering what was happening in Ral Aram, let alone influence court politics. Yasna was not completely defeated, but it would take her years to recover. Dalinar sat at the king's table, his hostility toward Elokar far less evident than it had been a few weeks before. Once again, Meridas sat in the place normally reserved for the king's second portion. Yasna frowned slightly as she saw the smooth-mannered nobleman. He was far too conniving for a male, and far too successful in his politics for one from such a relatively unknown house. Elokar stood, waving for Yasna to approach his table. She moved forward, bowing before him. I wish you would consent to wearing jewelry, sister, he said quietly. It is unseemly of the king's sister to appear so plain, especially on her betrothal day. Yasna gave no response. Traditional or not, this was one matter on which she would offer no concession. Elokar sighed, turning to the crowd. I have some business that needs to be attended to before this competition begins, he said unnecessarily to the quiet room. His next words were a surprise, however. 
You, he said, pointing at a young nobleman in a green sea silk shirt and loose brown trousers. Stand before your king. The young man flushed slightly, embarrassed. Yasna turned, resting her uncuffed hand lightly on the king's table. She didn't recognize the man, but his cloak bore Jezenrosh's glyph. The young nobleman rose, then walked forward and fell to one knee before the king's table. Introduce yourself to the court, Elokar ordered, leaning forward, hands on the table as he looked down at the younger man. I am Fifth Lord Islin Naninarin of Crossguard, your majesty. Fifth Lord of Crossguard? A shard bearer. Indeed, his yet unbonded blade could be seen leaning against his table. Yasna recognized his family name, but only vaguely. When were you given your blade? Elokar demanded. Several months ago, your majesty, the young man said. From Lord Jezenrosh, it belonged to one of his men who had died in the war. And where is your Lord Jezenrosh now? Elokar asked. In Crossguard, your majesty the man said, eyes still lowered. He regrets his inability to attend, but his illness forbids it. Elokar stood upright, waving the young shard bearer away. Yasna felt a chill. She recognized the dangerous anger in her brother's eyes. Hear that, court of Alethkar, the king announced. I ordered every shard bearer in my realm to attend this feast yet my cousin sees fit to ignore his king. In his place, he sends two unknown shard bearers, men granted blades less than a hundred days ago, men none of us have even met. Don't do this, Elokar, Yasna thought, taking a step toward him. He stopped her with a glare. Perhaps Lord Jezenrosh truly is ill, Elokar said. Perhaps for some reason, he needs to keep his other shard bearers at his side, sending only these pups to answer his king's command. Either way, he is no longer able to fulfill his duties as Parshan. Therefore, I relieve him of the title, lest it burden him further. Yasna sighed. The title of Parshan once given was normally only withdrawn in response to treason. Jezenrosh had many relatives, allies, and friends. Taking his title was a slap that would be felt across many faces. The crowd seemed less surprised than it should have been. Of course they knew, Yasna thought. This is too conniving a move for Elokar to have managed on his own. It has been planned ever since the king announced the dueling competition. Yasna eyed Nanava, who was smiling contentedly at her table. Ladies de Sol and Senes at her side, the wives of the two most powerful third lords in Alethkar. She was behind Elokar's order that all shard bearers attend the competition, but what reason could she possibly have to oust Jezenrosh? Lord Meridas Isvenda, Elokar said, turning. The tall merchant fell to one knee. For service to your king and country, I grant you lordship of the city of Oranja, formerly of Pralir. Oranja shall bear the rank of fourth city until the time of the next census. I also name you Parshan to the king, warden of Prala. Select for yourself a shard blade from those to be awarded this evening. Yasna's displeasure seethed. Following Jezenrosh's release, Meridas's appointment was hardly surprising. The merchant finally had the power he had sought so hard to obtain. Now he would be an even more potent force in Alice politics. With its oath gate, Orinja would quickly become one of the most powerful cities in the kingdom. Yasna was so displeased that she almost missed Elokar's nod for his wife to stand. It was time. My lord the queen said loudly. I have decided to exercise my right of decision. Lady Yasna Kolin has served her house well, but it is time that she be wedded. Nanava paused, 
then smiled slightly. Oddly, I see another problem in the court that needs to be rectified. Lord Meridas has a new duty and a new blade, but he too is unwedded, an unfitting state for a king's portion. Therefore, I give Lady Yasna to him, assuming his mother approves. Let Lady Yasna Colin be married to Lord Meridas Isvenda. Yasna stood dumbly. She turned from Nanava to the king and finally to the smiling Meridas. What? Meridas stood. I am very pleased by this opportunity to become brothers with the king I love so much, he announced, and even more pleased to receive a woman as beautiful and capable as Lady Yasna. I shall send word to my mother immediately. The wedding can occur as soon as she blesses the union, my lady queen. Elokar smiled broadly. Then the betrothal is official. Let the duels begin. Chapter 26 Jack 5 Jack, son, son, Volano, truthless of Shinovar, moved quickly in the night. Around him tents glowed from within like massive luminescent fungi. Where there was light, there were shadows, and where there were shadows, he was unseen. He paused, crouching in the darkness, peering through the Dabar camp. He couldn't believe that they had returned so quickly and with such force. Even in the darkness he could see the banners waving with the symbol of House Renar. The southern nobles, seeing the movements of the wind, had proposed allegiance with Talshech. There was no longer any pretense, no reason for Davar to accept the rule of an idiot king. Talshech had arrived back at Baden City earlier in the day. Avin wouldn't survive the night. Jack scuttled away, slipping over smoothed rock, moving silently through the camp. He had finally finished with Avin's list— the last few names had, surprisingly, been men in Talshech Devar's army. Their deaths would soon be discovered. Yet strangely, Talshech's own name had not been on the list. Why not have him assassinate Lord Talshech? In Shinovar, killing the leader of an army would be immaterial. Clan leadership was soundly structured, and no army would falter from the loss of one man, no matter how important. In the East, however— Things were different. Leaders often provided sole inspiration for their men. Perhaps often realized that this situation was different. Yaakov had been shattered and unified simultaneously. The houses had risen against one another, then had solidified behind a single leader. Even if that man died, an army would still sit outside of Vaden City. Yes, killing Talshech would end one threat, but even if another civil war ensued, one thing would be universally understood. Avin could not remain on the throne. Jack could see it now, Talshech's pavilion. Getting in would be difficult. Here the walls were cloth and not stone. Sounds traveled easily, and signs of struggle could be seen by flickering light. Killing Talshech would not solve Avin's basic problem, but it probably wouldn't hurt. The more squabbling, the more confusion, the longer the idiot king would have to plan. Jack leaned down, staying close to the ground, his cheek almost touching the stone beneath. He felt the rock with his fingertips, whispering an apology for the blood he must spill upon it. Avin had given no order to attack Talshech, but Jack's bond was more than simple slavery of body. It required more. It required honor and duty, without the rewards of either. If killing Talshech helped his master, then truth demanded he act. And then he saw them. Four men bearing staves of wood, slowly patrolling the perimeter of Talshech's tent— men with light skin and familiar clothing, shin warriors. Jack shrank back into the darkness, surprised. 
Where had Tashech found Shin willing to serve him? Were they truthless? No, that couldn't be possible. It would be too much of a coincidence. The men held identical staves and walked with familiarity. They were of the same clan. Volnakandan? Trudenashes? Both were clans of the staff. But why would they— Jack felt his palms grow slick against the stone. It had been long since he had faced a true warrior. Too long. There could be only one reason they would consent to guarding Talshech. He must have convinced them that he was in danger from a Shin assassin. They would be watching for one such as Jack. How many more were there? Four alert Shin warriors were enough of a risk on their own, but if there were others... Jack slipped back into the darkness. He would serve his bond foolishly if he got himself killed without orders. He would let Avon decide. Jack frowned as he searched the city. It was busy despite the late hour. The people knew that Talshech's army had returned, and many probably understood what that meant. Already merchants had rushed from the city, offering goods and comforts to the wearied troops. The gates were wide open, a sign from the nobility of Vadenar. They would give up their fool of a king willingly, if it would bring their own safety. Except that king was not to be found. The nobility was visibly disturbed. Their messengers and servants scuttled through the city as bobs of lantern light, searching frantically for their sacrificial monarch. Without proof of his blood, they would not be able to ensure the invader's good will. Jack crouched on a rooftop, watching a particular lantern-lit figure on the streets below. He recognized the man despite his lack of uniform. He was one of Avon's guards— one of those who had appeared to know his king's secret. He had been waiting in the shadows outside Avon's palace, hiding as best an Easterner could manage, when the assembled troops of the Vaden nobility had come for the king. The soldier was probably loyal, but he was terrible at sneaking. He constantly looked over his shoulder, and he crept when he should have strolled. Even the other Easterners should have noticed something suspicious about his movements. Jack was surprised that none of the many street-goers gave the soldier a second look. They were too busy with their own problems to realize that the answer they sought was lurking his way past them on the street. The low stone buildings of Vaden City were perfect for rooftop following, and Jack had no trouble tailing his prey. The man's destination, however, gave him pause— Jack settled down against the firm stone of a roof, crouching and studying the building the soldier entered. The structure was taller than most, though still only one story. Its sloping rock walls glistened with flakes of quartz, and even in the darkness Jack could make out the lavish metal ornamentations on the pillars and doors. In front, a tall bronze statue stood with an outstretched hand, pointing toward the city. In his other hand, the statue held a triangular shield, the Canaran symbol of justice. Jack pulled back into the shadows, thinking. The statue could only represent one figure, Nail Elin, Herald of Justice. He was the one Jack's people called Halanatan, stoneborn of blood opal. Jack had always avoided the Elinra temples. The heathens' common-day perversions were bad enough. He hadn't any desire to know what the clandestine new religions did with the sacred stories of the Ten Stoneborn. Yet if Aben was associated with the Church of Nail, it would explain much. Of all the Ilinra cults, the Church of Nail was one of the most secretive yet most powerful. Jack could finally stop wondering how Aben could act so innocently impotent, yet have such good information. Jack dropped from the rooftop into the alley beside. He could not wait. If Avon was truly inside the Ilinra temple, then the king would probably not remain there for long. Avon's smartest course of action was probably flight, and if the king escaped, it could take Jack months to track him down. 
Jack stepped into the light and adopted the air of urgency he had seen in the postures of so many this night. Hopefully, if someone saw him, they would think him simply another attendant, rushing to warn his master's allies of the king's disappearance. He quickly approached the Alinra temple. He kept his head bowed, partially not to draw attention and partially so he wouldn't have to look up at the paganized image of Nail Elin. How little the heathens understood! Could they not see that the stone-born were holy, that their images should not be crafted into any substance that was not stone? Even worse, Jack knew of the Canaran's preference for using the sacred arts. The statue probably hadn't been of bronze when it was first sculpted. For some reason the use of sacred powers in combination with the creation of a desecrated icon was even worse than most paganisms. The temple's broad gates were not open, but the soldier had entered through a secondary, smaller door. Jack approached this, trying to decide how far he would go to discover the king's location. These men might be Ovin's allies. Killing them would be unwise. However, there was also the possibility that they had the idiot king held captive, and that the soldier Jack had trailed was a traitor. The small door opened as Jack approached, revealing a darkened hallway beyond. Two men stood in deep blue cloaks, not black, for that was reserved for awakeners. The men had their hoods drawn after the manner of those trying to appear secretive and mysterious. We were told that you might come, one of them said in a quiet voice. You may enter, man of Shinovar. Realize, however, the privilege given you. Many wait years before being allowed admittance to the home of the sacred brotherhood. Jack kept his tongue, wondering if these men understood just how foolish they appeared. If they wished to be secretive, they should have studied the Shin clans of the Blade, clans such as the one Jack had once belonged to. A Shin clan would never have built a massive building in the middle of the city to proclaim how enigmatic it was. Clans of the Blade were unseen, unheard, but deadly. The hallway inside was crafted completely of bronze. Jack stepped onto the metal floor with relief. It was only a short removal from the stone, but it was a welcome one. One of the cloaked figures led him through cramped bronze corridors that twisted around in a spiral, eventually leading him to a doorway encrusted with various gemstones. The only illumination came from a candle held by Jack's guide. The man pushed open the door, and Jack was pleased to see the idiot king inside. Avon wore no robe. In fact, he wore clothing far less extravagant than normal. Sea silks after the noble cut, but unladen by gemstones or jewelry. He wore a deep red cloak with the hood pulled back. The room felt large compared to the tiny hallways, though it was probably only about fifteen feet square. It was illuminated by ten glowing braziers which cast a rubicon glow across the metallic walls. Cloaked Brotherhood members knelt along the walls. Oven, however, stood, looking toward four bundles of cloth that lay on a raised dais at the back of the room. They were children, Jack realized cloaked almost completely in dark swaths of sea silk. The youngest was perhaps ten years old, the eldest a girl that might have been in her late teens. The children sat with their hands forward, trails of sand streaming from clenched fists onto the ground in front of them. Their eyes watched the falling sand. The entire dais, Jack realized, was crafted from a black stone. Onyx. No, Jack thought with shock. That isn't possible. He hissed quietly in surprise, stepping into the room, studying the children's faces and skin. No, they were not Shin. They were Kanaran, but it was impossible. You must find the girl, one of the children whispered, not looking up from his streaming sand, not even moving, save to eventually reach over to the pot of sand beside him to grab another handful. I know where she is, Ovin said, confident. You will lose her, the child said. 
you will have to find her again. Beware of the wind runner, the eldest of them said. I see him. He will not know you, but he could destroy you. Who is he? Avan demanded. The girl shook her head. I see. Patterns. Too many patterns. All of them point toward danger. You must move quickly, idiot king. Something has gone wrong in the world. It must have a leader. Conqueror, savior, or tyrant, it matters not. There must be unity. Now is a time for boldness, the boy who had spoken before agreed. I see chaos in the patterns. Our protectors have fallen. Someone must make ten kingdoms into one. The last handful of sand dropped, and the children did not reach for more. Avin nodded his head slightly, almost a bow, then turned toward Jack. Come, he said, striding from the room. Jack wasn't quick to follow. He stared at the children and at the sand and at the onyx. A fabrication, he told himself. They speak nonsense and imitate the patterns of the past. Somehow he couldn't quite convince himself. Assassin, Aubin snapped. Come. Jack turned and followed. Those were holotatinal, he said. Aubin raised an eyebrow. They did as seem shin to me, assassin, he said. Onyx Cirrus, Jack said, his voice, though quiet, echoing in the metal hallway. You realize they must be fake. There haven't been onyx seers in Kanar since the ninth epic. Perhaps, Avin said. They tell you what you want to hear, Jack insisted. They're obviously mimicking the actions of shinstone shamans. Avin didn't respond, so Jack tried another tactic. You should escape, he said. Talshech is guarded by Shin clansmen. I could try to assassinate him, but I would probably fail. Even if I kill him, another will try to take your throne. Avin shook his head. You're not going to kill Talshech, he said. Come. What are you going to do? Jack demanded as two robed forms opened the doors before them, letting Avin out onto the night street. You heard the seers, Avin said. It is time for boldness. Lord Talshech looked slightly less impressive without his shard plate. He was still massive, but much of that mass was contained in an ample gut and stocky legs. Despite the girth, he was well muscled, but his were the muscles of an aging man whose battles had mostly passed. He looked a little disheveled. He had probably taken Avin's disappearance as a sign that the king had fled. He certainly hadn't expected his enemy to stride into the middle of his camp, accompanied by nothing more than a couple of guards and a solitary Shin assassin. News of the arrival, however, brought crowds. Jack noted a large group of Vedanal noblemen gathering on one side of the camp, their eyes wide with pleasured surprise. Perhaps they had come pleading for their lives or to assure Talshech that their political enemies had been the ones who aided in Avin's disappearance. Avin stood quietly in the night, torches whispering before gusts of wind. What did he expect? That Talshech would accept his surrender? Avin held the throne. Talshech could not let such a threat to his leadership live. Indeed, as soon as Talshek stepped from his tent and saw Avin, the Devar lord smiled deeply and summoned his shard blade. Those in attendance would witness the murder, but they would not contradict Talshek's inevitable declaration that they had released the country from incompetent rule, that he had performed his act in the name of justice rather than ambition. Talshek stepped forward and swung his blade at the idiot king's head. Avin ducked nearly falling to the ground as he whipped back his cloak and pulled a sword from beneath its depths. Avin spun behind the surprised Talshech. The idiot king was trained as a warrior. He wasn't masterful, Jack could see that much. Neither was he incompetent. However, no great amount of skill was required to dodge Talshech's arrogant strike. Nor was mastery necessary to spin behind the large man as Avin did, his own shard blade raised high over his head. 
Avon sheared Talshek's head in half with a single stroke. Avon had probably meant to aim for the neck, but he hit somewhere right below the ear instead. It didn't matter. The blade cut through the large Davar nobleman's head with ease. Talshek's corpse slumped to the ground. The crowd's eyes lingered on it, stunned. Of course Avon has a sharp blade, Jack realized. He's king. They couldn't have kept one from him, idiot or not. The blade is a sign of nobility. Avon stood before the crowd, bloodied sword held in firmly in a post-swing posture. Last night the Almighty appeared to me in a dream, he said loudly. It took Jack a moment to realize what was wrong. Avon's accent was gone. He sounded normal. He said he would heal me of my infirm mind, for the three houses needed a leader. Tal Shech, obviously, was not that leader. Then Avon stood up straight and dismissed his blade. The idiot king strode forward, stepping over Tal Shech's body, and walked toward the open city gates. Jack thought that someone might challenge him, but no one did. Jack hurried after Avon, glancing back with apprehension. The collected noblemen were still staring at the corpse. Now what? Jack asked, turning back to Avon. Now, Avon said with a smile, we wait for them to figure it out. I have another task for you. Someone you need dead? No, Avon replied. Someone I need retrieved. Chapter 27 Marin 6 Let the duels begin! Marin forced his cheers to sound as enthusiastic as those of the other men. Indeed, he couldn't help but absorb the feast hall's general feeling of levity. Servants burst from the side doors, bringing forth steaming dishes. Men around him rested their fine-clothed arms on the tables and began to chat with enthusiasm, speculating on the evening's matches. Marin, sitting amidst it all, found the experience almost surreal. Part of him was still the son of a sixth citizen farmer. That part didn't belong in a position of respect between Dalinar's two sons at a table with an enviable view of the second dueling ring. Yet that had somehow become his place. Another part of Marin, a part growing ever stronger, found the men around him increasingly familiar, the spicy food increasingly delicious, and the sea silk clothing increasingly natural. The excitement was almost enough to make him forget about his own inability to participate in the competition. There will be other duels, other competitions. Don't worry yourself, lad. You shall see enough of fighting in your life. They were Delinar's words, spoken to him when Arador had complained about Vasher's restriction. Arador was still noticeably upset. Though he joked with the young men at the table, every time he saw Marin's yet unbonded shard blade sitting beside his chair, his lips downturned slightly. He had obviously been looking forward to this event as an opportunity to reveal his young protege to the court at large. Despite his relative open-mindedness, Arador was still a nobleman and did not like having his plans diverted by the whims of a low-born monk. Marin glanced toward the king's table, looking past scurrying servants, boisterous noblemen, and nervous duel participants. The king's table sat before the primary dueling ring, the one where the main competition for shard blades would take place. Arador and Renarin had chosen a table near the right-hand ring instead, claiming that duels between shard-bearers were more interesting. The victors in these duels would earn not only honor, but a fair opportunity of gaining lordship of a city in the newly conquered lands of Aleth Prala. At the king's table, Lord Dalinar's austere face looked worried, even more so than usual. The king's demotion of Lord Jezenrosh had obviously unsettled Dalinar. Apparently removing the title of Parshan from a man was an irregular move. Yet the rest of the crowd seemed to have accepted the decision. Jezen Rosh hadn't been seen in court for a long time, and it was obvious he wasn't fulfilling his duties as Parshan. Even Arador seemed to have gotten over the announcement, 
though he had hissed in anger when Elokar first made it. Dalinar obviously hadn't moved on so easily. Marin tried to imagine Lord Dalinar as people had described him in his youth, outgoing, even rowdy, with a loud voice and a love of fighting. Marin shook his head. He couldn't picture such a thing. Marin had known only one Dalinar, stern but kind, dutiful and reserved. He sat with a quiet sense of decorum as the men around him, including the king, made rancor. This is the type of nobleman I would be. Marin turned his attention back to the ring before his table, where the first contestants were preparing to duel. Marin heard cheers from behind as the other matches began, but he was glad for Arador's choice of tables. He had never seen Shardbearer's duel up close, and Basher had instructed him to be observant of the forms and styles used. Their ring was by far the largest of the three, and the tables were set back from its perimeter. Both contestants wore shard plate, either their own or borrowed. The armors were more colorful than Marin's. He had been forced to spend most of his monthly stipend on clothing and other requirements of class. It would be some time before he could afford to have the armorers accent his plate with designs, paints, or silks. The contestants raised shard blades, the sign that both had summoned their weapons, and the match began. The first one to score two hits in the same general location would be declared the winner. The two men clinked forward, obviously well accustomed to moving in shard plate. One man wore plate that had been painted a ruddy brown, and his blade was a wide-bladed weapon, thicker at the top than at the base, almost like a large, intricate cleaver. The other man's weapon was thinner than most, his armor a light, almost imperceptible green. Marin watched with interest as they made their first tentative strikes, judging one another. When are you up? Renarin asked, leaning forward to look past Marin at his brother. Eighteenth, Arador replied. I'm dueling Tyran of Fardust. The crowd cheered as the man with the thin sword scored a direct thrust against his opponent's chest. I've never seen a shard blade meant for stabbing before, Marin noted. There aren't many of them, Arador replied. Most of the dueling forms discourage thrusting, and it's against protocol to attack the face. Why? Marin asked, as the two shard bearers moved back to the edges of the ring to begin the second point. Arador shrugged. It's always been that way, ever since the forms were developed, back during the days of the Epic Kingdoms. There was probably a reason. People didn't use spears or arrows very often back then either. The second point ended quickly as the red-armored shard-bearer used his greater size to push his opponent nearly to the edge of the ring, eventually striking a loud blow against the side of the man's head. Even with dulled blades, the blow sounded painful, but the green-armored man raised a hand, indicating he could continue. As they prepared for the third point, Marin turned his attention to the food. Back in Stone Mount, he had been accustomed to simple Innova cakes and soup, with the occasional splurge of pork, good, robust food, as his mother had always called it. The lords, however, could never do anything with simplicity. Even after two months in Kolinar, Marin was barely accustomed to the spices. He always forced himself to eat them, however, even when he wasn't dining at evening meal with Lord Dalinar and his sons. He needed to learn how to be like the others. So he dished himself several large slices of glazed pork and then carved off a chunk and downed it. The taste was amazing! But the heat of the spices followed immediately, and Marin reached for his flagon of wine, gulping it down. Arador chuckled at Marin's red face. Go easy on that, he said, nodding to the gold flagon. Remember, you only get three cups. Marin nodded. It was Lord Dalinar's restriction. The way of kings forbid drunkenness of the nobility, a prohibition most of the other lords seemed to ignore. Dalinar had ordered all members of his house to drink no more than three flagons. For Dalinar, that was almost gluttonous. At Kolinar dinners, they were allowed only one. 
Marin set the flagon down, barely able to taste the wine's sweet flavor over the spices. He had never had alcohol before leaving Stone Mount, but the other spearmen had made certain to rectify that oversight as soon as they discovered it. Those were not nights he would miss with any great sense of loss. He had trouble remembering them anyway. The bout ended with the green-armored knight making good on his first strike, sweeping his opponent's feet out from beneath him and scoring another hit to the man's chest. The onlooking men cheered enthusiastically. The women smiled in their controlled way. The next bout began almost immediately. As the evening progressed, Marin watched the duels with fascination. Though he was growing more and more accustomed to shard plate and its quirks, it still amazed him that men could move so fluidly within its confines. Those who were well trained were able to perform some extraordinary feats for the crowd, jumping nearly half the length of the thirty-foot ring, swinging their blades with such power that they hummed in the air, and smashing each other's armor with such force that even the shard plate showed some dents from the blows. As he watched, Marin thought he saw the things that Basher wanted him to notice. Those who were trained in their plate, not just in dueling, had an enormous advantage. In addition, the differences between fighting styles were amazing. Each man seemed to have his own personal form, and the various shard blades reflected this. Even among similar styles, the blades each bore slight differences in length or shape, matching their master's needs. As the eighteenth bout approached, Arador rose, moving to the dressing square, where servants helped shardbearers don or remove their armor. He returned a few moments later, wearing his plate, a frown on his face. What? Marin asked. Tyran forfeited, Arador explained, sitting with a clink. The chair held his weight. The fine hardwood was reinforced with steel to accommodate shardbearers. Marin frowned. Why? Something he ate yesterday has apparently made him ill, Arador replied. He thought he could fight, but he's had a relapse. Well, that's good for you, Renarin noted. You advance automatically. Arador shrugged. There's not really much for me to gain by winning this. I'm already heir to a third city. Given the choice, I'd rather duel than just advance. Marin nodded in understanding. He would rather have dueled and lost, as opposed to just watching. As Arador tapped his gauntleted fingers on the table, obviously frustrated, a page wiggled between the room's tables and approached. Lord Arador, the young man said, we may have found a substitute for Lord Tyran. If you still wish to compete in the first round? Arador perked up. Who? Lord Arador, a smooth voice said from behind. Marin turned with surprise, recognizing a narrow-faced man. Meridas, now Parshan Meridas, stood outfitted in bright gold and silver shard plate with a blood-red cape. His new shard blade sat clasped before him, point down, wearing a protective metal sheath over its edge. Lord Meridas, Arador said slowly, you are the replacement? Indeed, Meridas said, eyeing Marin and Renarin. Your companions do not participate? Lord Renarin, well, we can understand his predicament. He has embarrassed House Colin enough. But the peasant shardbearer? Why is he sitting out? Are you worried that he too will make a fool of himself before the court? Watch yourself, Meridas, Arador warned. No, Meridas said pleasantly. You be certain to watch your tongue, Lord Arador. It appears that I now outrank you. You may be cousin to the king, but I will soon be his brother. Besides, what was it you once told me about not crossing Parsons? Arador flushed, standing. Bring your blade, merchant, he spat, waving the page away. Let us begin. Arador, Renarin said uncertainly. Arador, however, held up a forestalling hand, then gestured for Meridas to enter the ring. Meridas nodded agreeably and took his place. I don't understand, 
Marin said to Renarin as Arador entered the ring, holding out his hand and summoning his shard blade. I've seen Meridas at the monastery, but he only became a shard bearer a few minutes ago. How can he hope to fight Arador with blades? Look at his weapon, Renarin said. The opal. Marin squinted, catching a glimpse of Meridas's pommel stone. The opal was nearly black. It's nearly as dark as mine is, Marin objected. But how? He must have had a shard blade some time before, Renarin explained. One that he lost somehow, like I did. If he took the opal off of it before he lost it, he could use that opal on the new blade. You can do that? Marin asked with surprise. Renarin nodded, fishing in his cloak pocket for a moment, then bringing out a dark black stone. If I ever get another blade, I can attach this and bond it quickly. Of course, I don't really care. I never wanted one in the first place. It just gave people an excuse to try and duel me. Marin frowned at the new information, turning back to the dueling ring. How long until he bonds it completely? That depends on how long it's been since he lost his blade, Renarin said. A few days at most. Most rebonds take only a few moments. He must have lost the blade many years ago. The duel began, and suddenly Marin was very worried. Everyone said that Arador was one of the finest duelists in the kingdom. In fact, he was highly favored to win the Shardbearer's competition. Marin could see confidence in his friend's eyes. Arador expected to beat Meridas with ease. He hadn't noticed the opal. The first exchange made that mistake obvious. Every duelist's style was different, but they all followed similar lines of development. As the previous duels had progressed, Arador had named off the various dueling styles for Marin, each named after the gemstone that fit the personality of the style. Sapphire form, with its wide swings and flowing movements, ruby form with its blazing offense, and others. Meridas's style was unlike any Marin had seen that evening. He stood with a relaxed, almost indifferent posture, shard blade held point down beside his right leg. When Arador approached for the first testing swing, however, Meridas changed. Marin didn't even see Meridas's hand move. The arm was a blur as he raised his weapon for a sudden flurry of one-handed attacks. The blade snapped four times against Arador's armor, the blows ringing in the air. The final blow took Arador in the back, smashing with such power that Meridas split the sheath from his shard blade, throwing the two pieces of metal to the sides and leaving a large scar across the back of Arador's silver armor. Arador groaned, raising a hand to the side of his helmet where Meridas had struck him twice. Meridas stepped back, once again nonchalant, weapon held beside him in the same strange, unconcerned dueling stance. The officiator awarded him a point. Only one could be gained per exchange, but Meridas raised a hand. I forfeit, he said idly, strolling from the ring. Arador stumbled back toward their table, the crowd watching with stunned eyes. His eyes were dazed as he dismissed his blade, then pulled off his helm. By the winds, he hissed, regarding the helm with stupefaction. How did he hit me so hard? And so quickly. What did he learn to duel like that? Renarin was watching the retreating Meridas, his eyes troubled. That one is not what we assumed, he whispered. No need to tell me, Arador mumbled, reaching back and trying to feel the scar on the back of his plate. Finally he just sighed, pounding the table with an armored fist. He took me by surprise, he complained. I was a fool. I thought— Marin shrugged helplessly. At least you weren't eliminated. He retreated so that I wouldn't have a chance to prove I could beat him, Ardor said with a curse. He attacked when he knew I wouldn't be ready for him, then left before I could redeem myself. He didn't want to defeat me. He wanted to humiliate me. The crowd's shock wore away as the next two duelists entered the ring. Eventually, Arador tromped off to remove his armor, and Marin returned to his overly flavorful meal. Renarin, however, continued to watch the king's table, 
regarding Meridas with one of his indecipherable looks. Chapter 28 Shinri, 5 Shinri could tell immediately that something was wrong. Not from Lady Yasna's face. It was stone, like always. Nel Shenden, however, looked sick with worry. He didn't stand near the wall like the other nobleman soldier attendants, but squatted beside Lady Yasna's table, speaking quietly with her. Shinri hastened her step as she entered the feast hall, pushing through the scents of feasting and the sounds of dueling. Shame burned within her. She had spent too long in Thelana, talking with King Amelin. When she'd hurried to return, she'd been caught in the traffic at the Oath Gate, noblemen of far higher rank than her traveling to Alethkar to view or participate in the duels. Despite protests, she'd been forced to wait for hours before returning. She'd hoped to make it in time for the betrothal announcement, but apparently she'd just missed it. What had happened? Why did Lady Yasna sit at the Queen's table rather than her own? My lady, Shinri said, hurrying to the stool beside Yasna, etiquette forgotten for the moment. Yasna looked up at her with disapproving eyes, eyes that could make Shinri feel shame even when she did something right. Though at the queen's table, Lady Colin sat alone, several seats separating her from any of the queen's normal attendants. Shinri, Yasna said flatly. I expected you to arrive on time for this event. Be thankful that my brother pays little attention to women. If you had been a shard bearer, he would likely have reprimanded you. Shinri flushed. My lady, she trailed off, looking at Nell Shenden. The handsome soldier's face was dark. She couldn't ever remember seeing such anger in the honest man's eyes. Menacing, dangerous anger. Who? Shinri demanded. Nell Shenden nodded toward the king's table and the man sitting at Elokar's right hand. The merchant lord, Meridas. Him? Shinri sputtered. His majesty made that pig a parson, Nell Shenden said with a dark tone, and gave him a shard blade. I- Enough, Nell Shenden, Yasna snapped. That man is to be my husband. Nell Shenden fell silent. But my lady, Shinri said, married us. Thinking about him made her feel as if her mind had been dipped in grease. She glanced toward the king's table and found the man's calm, yet somehow scandalous eyes watching her, stripping her to the bones, or maybe just to the flesh that coated them. Shinri turned away. Meridas will be an important lord in my brother's kingdom, Yasna explained. He will need a woman acquainted with politics. Through being his wife, I can be of great service to my brother. It is a far better union than I had feared. Perhaps I was wrong in assuming the queen would exile me to an unimportant city. There was something in her tone. Another person wouldn't have been able to recognize it. But Shinri had spent years learning beneath Yasna's tutelage. She could see hints of the emotion Yasna hid. Pain, hurt, carefully tucked away, unacknowledged, suppressed, but still potent. No, Yasna did not want to marry this man. Not at all. Shinri lay a hand on Yasna's, and Yasna looked into her eyes. Right then, finally, Shinri understood. Yasna wasn't heartless. The woman couldn't make her emotions go away. She was just very, very good at hiding them. Suddenly, Shinri felt closer to Yasna than she ever had in the past three years. That man is not honorable, Nell Shenden whispered. There is nothing you can do, Nell Shenden, Yasna said, her eyes becoming cold again, emotions checked with a skill that Shinri could only envy. 
There is something I can do, Nell Shenden said. I could challenge him, a high duel. Shinri started slightly. A high duel? Duel to the death. He would do it, too. Nell Shenden was so cursed, honorable, and idealistic that he would get himself slaughtered to protect Yasna's honor. No, Yasna said. You will not die dueling that man, Nell Shenden. I could win his shard blade, the guard replied. I could be worthy of you. He left off the last part, but Shinri could read his eyes. You would die, Yasna said. Lord Meridas has a shard blade, and you saw him fight young Arador. The new Parshan has great skill in dueling. He would slaughter you. I would almost prefer that, Nell Shenden whispered. This is no time for vendettas, Yasna informed sharply. Or have you forgotten that the king's life is in danger? Mention of duty brought Nell Shenden slightly out of his darkened state. I remember, my lady. Has Kemnar returned yet? Yasna asked. Nell Shenden shook his head. I have not seen him since last night, when he visited the palace in beggar's clothing. Even then, his reports were not encouraging. If the Stormkin assassins have people inside of the city, then we have not been able to discover them. What would you have me do, Yasna? Shinri asked, feeling ashamed. She had let her fixation with Tethryn take her away from where she was needed. For once, perhaps the only time in her recent life, Yasna had suffered a shock she could barely handle, and Shinri had been off tracking down a dead man. Perhaps not dead, a piece of her whispered. But irrelevant at the moment, anyway, she argued back. Her duty was to Yasna. There is much to do, Yasna said. I'll need you to visit the tables of the other women and listen for anything suspicious. There are ladies here from across all of Alethkar. Perhaps one of them will give us the clue we need. I cannot leave the queen's table. We'll have to rely on you for information tonight. I understand, my lady, Shinri said. Here, Yasna said, handing Shinri a letter. Deliver this first. The other ladies were already exchanging secrets and proposing alliances, but Yasna appeared to have only this one letter. The betrothal announcement had shocked her indeed. Who is it for? Shinri asked. Lord Arador Colin, Yasna explained. Shinri frowned. A man? Tell him to have someone he trusts read it to him, Yasna said. Someone he trusts very much. Yes, my lady. Shinri said, rising to weave her way through the tables to the edge of the room. The men cheered as a shard bearer was defeated, their mirth somewhat distracting. Sometimes she envied them and the freedom their innocence brought. Most were simple tribute lords or shard bearers. They didn't have to worry about plots and betrayals. They could come to a feast simply to enjoy the duels and eat a good meal. Shenry glanced at the king's table as she passed, and Meridas paused in his conversation just long enough to give her another of his filthy stares. Oh, Yasna, she thought, as she scuttled past. I know you're strong, but this? And yet, Yasna would survive. She was demanding of those around her, but nowhere near as demanding as she was with herself. She would take her betrothal and use it to her best advantage. A woman couldn't simply take up a shard blade and duel away her problems. She had to be clever, patient, and persistent. The Prala War was but a breeze to the high storm that is coming. Dangerous times approach. King Amelin's words returned to her. He had been so apprehensive. What did he know? What was he planning for? Stop it, Shinri told herself. You're back serving Yasna now. You let yourself get distracted by Tethryn and Thalana and weren't here when you were needed. You need to focus, like Lady Yasna told you to. Unfortunately, 
She couldn't banish her worries so easily. The contrived fiasco of Tethryn's death was far too suspicious, and King Amelin's words were far too ominous. Yasna had trained Shinri too well. She couldn't help considering the things she had discovered. I'll discuss them with Yasna this evening, Shinri decided. She'll know how to interpret what has happened. She would be annoyed at Shinri for keeping the investigation of Tethryn's death secret, but that couldn't be helped any longer. Events were growing too large for Shinri to manage alone. Decision made, Shinri sought out Dalinar's heir. Arador sat with his brother and the solemn young shard-bearer Marin Colin. They had a very good table, of course. Lord Arador was one of the most popular young men of the court and sat watching the duels in the southern ring. Arador had his shard blade summoned, as did Marin, and they were obviously comparing the blades. Shinri bowed slightly as she approached. Lord Arador, she said, drawing his attention. All three young men looked up. I... Shinri froze. There, sitting on the table, was Tethryn's shard blade. She knew it, of course. Hope Light, it was called. A majestic blade that bore a crystalline pattern etched into its metal. The pattern was dull now, like a statue that had been weathered by countless winds. And in its place, an unfamiliar design was beginning to emerge, something akin to flowing rivulets of water. Yet, despite the wearing, despite the new bond, the hint of Tethryn's touch was unmistakable. The glyphs that had run along the blade were still visible, and Shinri had known that blade as she had known the man himself. She couldn't move. She could only stare at the table. Lady Shinri! Arador said with a grin, obviously not noticing her incapacitation. Doesn't our Lord Merrin look handsome this evening? Almost like the grand hero the court has made him out to be, eh? Arador looked at his young companion, smiling and winking. Where? Shinri whispered. Where did you get that shard blade? Oh, surely you've heard the story, Shinri? Arador said dramatically. Lord Merrin saved the king's life, you know. An unknown shard bearer tried to kill his majesty on the battlefield. Ignored protocol, even. But Lord Merrin intervened, jumped up and pulled the faceless man right off his horse. It's quite a story. You should have Merrin tell it to you sometime. You just told it to her, Arador, Merrin said, blushing. Shinri ignored them both. Unknown shard bearer tried to kill his majesty. She knew of the event, of course. She had been with Yasna near the battlefield when it happened. She had paid little attention to it, however. Despite gossip about the strange faceless shard bearer that had tried to kill King Elokar, an unknown man without glyph to identify him. The sinking of the ship was to cover something else, Amelin had said. Something about the way Tethryn died, though I can't figure out what. House Renar had tried to assassinate King Elokar on the battlefield. It was inconceivable, and yet her proof was unmistakable. The shard blade lay on the table, Tethryn's touch upon it seeming to fade by the moment. Though her mind was stunned, Shinri's body knew what it had been sent to do. She dropped the letter to the table. Have someone you trust read it to you, Lord Ardor, she heard herself mumble. Then she turned, walking from the room and its jovial occupants, with their masculine cheering and feminine manipulations. She walked out into the hallway, seeking a bit of quiet to think. Why would the Renar try to kill Elokar? Why would they do it on the battlefield? And the most confusing question of all, how would they have persuaded Tethryn to take part in such a dishonorable act? The man she had known would never have broken protocol. And yet, how well 
had she really known him? She had still been mostly a child then. Even if her impression had been truthful, they had seen each other little during the last year. Men changed. Shinri sighed, letting her fingers trail along the cool stone wall as she walked, the sounds of feasting growing dim behind her. The truth was, she knew very little. She was not Yasna, able to anticipate logical discoveries with an inhuman sense of inference. Tethryn's shard blade had been right before Shinri on several occasions, carried by the young Lord Marin, and she had never even noticed it. She might never have noticed it, had Marin not taken off the practice sheath to display the blade to his friends. Shinri paused her wanderings, leaning back against the stone wall with her eyes closed. Even knowing of his death, even having been separated from him for so long, seeing Tethryn's blade was a shock. It was the first tangible evidence that he was gone, a piece of her life cut away. While she couldn't really mourn a love lost, she could at least feel depressed at what might have been. I need to get back to Yasna, Shinri thought. She needs to know about this. It no longer affects just me. They tried to kill Elokar. Perhaps House Renar is allied with Jezenrosh. Lady Shinri Davar? a voice asked. Shinri jumped, opening her eyes. A man stood in the hallway before her. Dressed in the clothing of a merchant courtier, he had pale skin and large shin eyes. She opened her mouth to reply, then paused, realizing that she recognized his foreign features. She had seen him before, in the Vaden City Oathgate chamber. When he moved, his body displayed the same fluid control she had sensed in him on that day weeks before. Before she could so much as speak, he had his hand wrapped around her neck, something sharp pressed against her back. I apologize, child, he whispered to her in lightly accented Vaden. But you must come with me. Chapter 29 Taln 6 Taln gave Lon the slip after about two hours of watching jewels. Goodbye, my friend, Taln thought as he slumped down to hide his height, then ducked away amidst the massive crowd. He was outside in one of the palace's outer courtyards, where several dueling rings lay well illuminated in the night by torches and lanterns. The duelists who participated were of insignificant rank, nineteenth and twentieth lords, who had been eliminated from the prime competition, or lesser duelists from other countries. However, these duels were still exciting. A man's rank had little to do with his fighting ability. There were still prizes to be had, for the king had sponsored several prestigious events outside of the prime competition, as had some of the more wealthy merchant companies. Even if these men didn't win a shard blade, a victory in a lesser event could mean wealth and notoriety. Talon forced himself away from the dueling rings. He pushed through the crowd, shuffling beneath his cloak in a hunched posture. Lon had been right. The courtyard was extremely busy, dense with the scent of bodies. However, the monk had been wrong about the duels being boring. How could he not be intoxicated by the thrill of a well-fought contest? How could he not itch to participate, hands longing for the unity of mind and weapon? Talon could have watched the jewels in a joyful daze if his purpose hadn't been so urgent. As he approached the palace gates, he sought out a secluded overhang beside a vending tent, then stood and turned his cloak inside out. The inside, or actually the outside, since he had been wearing his cloak the wrong way around since leaving the monastery, was lined with brilliant blue sea silk. He'd purchased the cloth in secret, then sewn it to the outside of his cloak in the early hours of the morning when even the monks were asleep. He still felt guilty for gambling with the other crom cleaners, winning enough money to buy the sea silk, but he had been unable to think of another way. Talon stepped out from behind the tent and assumed a commanding posture. 
His plan would require more than a skin of silk. His cloak wasn't tailored like that of a nobleman. While it was bulky and masculine, it hung naturally on his body and didn't have the broad extended shoulders to give it the cape-like rectangular look that Rosharan lords favored. Nobility, however, was not in wealth or tailoring, but in attitude. Talm strode toward the palace doors, his cloak clasped shut in front of him, lest it open and reveal his common clothing beneath. His step was firm, his air important, and his lips formed a slight half-scowl. As he stepped up to the gates, one of the guards frowned slightly, regarding him. The man made as if to step forward, and Talm halted immediately, turning an intolerant look toward the man. "'Where would I find the primary competition?' he demanded, mimicking the noble accent as best he could. He would still have a bit of the backwater Remac accent in his voice he knew, but hopefully that would enhance the persona he was attempting to mimic. The guard paused. He was a younger man, with dark curly hair and a boyish face. My lord? he asked. The primary competition, Tolm repeated. Then, in a lower voice, he continued, Tell me, how is the king's mood today? I'm not sure, my lord, the guard confessed. Tom turned, looking toward the palace with a somewhat distracted expression, as if he were considering something unpleasant. Have any other lords arrived late? he asked. Not that I know of, my lord, the guard said. Tom's expression darkened. My father warned me of the king's temper. Do you think, perhaps— the joy of the festivities might make him more accepting of my tardiness. I'm not certain, my lord, the guard replied. Tal nodded curtly. Very well. Where can I find him? The guard pointed down the central hallway. To the east, my lord, in the grand feast hall. The guard paused for a moment. Good luck, my lord. Tom sighed, nodding his thanks, and strode into the palace. The truth was that he needed no directions. He probably knew the palace better than half of its occupants. Indeed, he knew things about its construction that had been kept secret even from kings. He quickly made his way through the pillared hallways and grand open foyers of the Aleth section. The grand feast hall was near the center of the ten-winged structure, with the other communal rooms. Even if he hadn't known his way, the location would have been obvious. Servants scuttled to and from the room, bringing food and drink, and lords in bright clothing stood in the hallway outside, speaking in quiet conference or boisterous discussion. Few paid Tolne any heed. Hopefully his affectation would mark him as a lord, but his relatively poor cloak would mark him as an unimportant one. The Grand Hall was nearly as crowded as the courtyards, though many of the people here were sitting, and the room smelled of perfumes and luxurious food rather than sweat. The women and men sat apart in three rings of tables, each one surrounding a dueling circle. Many of the male onlookers had risen from their tables to instead stand at the peripheral of the room to watch a particular duel. The most popular ring was the one at the center. Tom took his time, carefully scouting the room. He had intentionally waited until later in the day when reactions would be dulled by wine. The room had three exits, the main doors and two servants' entrances. If his memory served him, the exit on the east wall led through the kitchens and had an outlet to the main hallway. From there it was only two turns to the oath gates. There were several ten-set guards in the feast hall, but the congestion would make it difficult for them to react, especially if too many intoxicated noblemen decided to take arms against him. The oath gates would probably be guarded, but hopefully some of them would be open to allow for foreign noblemen to return to their homes. Tom circled the room several times, getting a feel for the layout and soldier placements. Eventually he stopped, joining a group of noblemen standing to the right of the king's table. From the conversations he overheard, the primary competition was nearing its end. The clang of swords rang over the voices of men, nearly drowning out the single balladess who sang in the far corner. 
The two noblemen who fought now would both be awarded shard blades for progressing so far. Their contest was a matter of prestige, and of rumors that the king had cities in Prala that still had not been assigned lords. Talm's target sat beside the king. His name was Lord Meridas, and he had apparently already been awarded a shard blade. Talm could see Glifting sitting on the table in front of the man. Its markings had been dulled considerably, almost completely, but he still knew the blade for what it was. Talm glanced to the side, eyes falling on a random nobleman standing a short distance away. The pommel of a sword jutted out from beneath the man's cloak, the hilt within reach. Talm stretched his fingers, then let his muscles relax, carefully falling into a combat stance. And then he saw a form moving through the crowd, a figure in tan robes and a nonchalant expression. Lawn. How had he— Talm eyed the sword hilt again. He just had to reach out and— as he tensed his muscles, however, the nobleman turned to a friend, hand falling on his pommel. "'I should have known I'd find you here,' Lon said, strolling up beside Tuln. "'And you were doing so well at staying out of trouble, too.' The monk paused, regarding Tuln's cloak. "'Who'd you steal that from?' "'I made it,' Tuln said. "'Last night.' Lon nodded, turning toward the central ring. So it was all an act. The king's not going to listen to you, Tone. I don't care what you say to him, his majesty will not be pleased if you interrupt his revelry a second time. If you'd wanted to see him, you should have just waited for Lady Yasna's promised audience. Tone didn't respond. He watched as the sword-bearing nobleman turned back to watch the jewel, hand still resting on his weapon's pommel. Tone glanced to the side. Lon was regarding him with a confused expression. The monk's eyes seemed to be searching for something. You're not going to make another announcement to the king, are you? Lon finally said. It was not a question. Talon shook his head. He nodded toward his target. I'm going to grab that man's sword, he said in a quiet voice. In the following confusion, I'm going to take down the two guards by the king's table. Then I'm going to take my shard blade back from the man sitting next to his majesty. I'll jump onto the table, run down its length toward the east wall, where I'll shove through the crowd and escape into the kitchens. From there I'll fight my way to the oath gates, take the best open portal, hopefully one to lock and run if it's open. From there I'll escape into the wilderness and use my blade to locate my brethren. Lon's eyes widened slightly, and he glanced toward the king. Town, this room is full of shard-bearers and guards— he hissed. Are you crazy? Tal met the monk's eyes. A realization seemed to spark in Lon's face. By the winds, Lon whispered quietly, you really are. I'd almost thought that— Tal turned away. Go, Lon. I told you what I planned for a reason. If you're still standing here when I move, they might connect you to me and cut you down before you can explain otherwise. Go! Lon didn't move. If you reach for that sword, I swear I'll scream. Talm snorted. I'll have the weapon before the sound leaves your throat, he said. Go. Talm, this is ludicrous, the monk said with a pleading voice, grabbing Talm's arm. You're not thinking clearly. You may not be able to think clearly. Trust me, no matter what your delusions claim, you aren't a soldier. Talm frowned. Where had he gotten that idea? You were defeated easily last time you confronted the king, and you had a shard blade then, Lon said. You're too familiar with common work to have been a soldier all your life. Please, trust me. Come back to the monastery. Don't do this. Even if you do get the sword away from that man, every lord in this room is an expert duelist. You won't make it ten paces before they kill you. Watch, then, Tolan said, shrugging off Lan's hands. Tom's target still held his pommel, but his grip was loose. It would simply be a matter of knocking his arm to the side before taking the weapon. You'll kill them then? Lon said quietly as the crowd cheered. If the soldiers resist, will you kill them? I may have to, Tom said. I need my shard blade back. 
"'What kind of herald would you be then?' Lon said quickly, as if he had discovered something incriminating. "'What servant of the Almighty would kill innocent men? You would perform an act of evil in order to get your sword back? You're all right with that?' "'Moral quandaries won't work on me, Lon,' Talon said softly. "'You have no idea how long I've wrestled with them.' Lon stepped in front of him. "'Just wait, Talon. Wait a few minutes. Talk this through.' "'Don't listen to him,' Talon thought. "'He's just stalling you.' "'But stalling for what? Something specific?' Lon seemed anxious. Suddenly the monk's face grew relieved. "'I do not call this staying out of trouble,' a firm voice said from behind, confirming Tuln's suspicions. Tuln turned to confront the Lady Yasna. She stood with folded arms, left sleeve drooping, her two guards nowhere to be seen. "'I don't have time for this madman,' she snapped. "'What is this about?' "'I told you earlier,' Tuln explained. "'I need to get my sword back, one way or another.' I see, the lady replied. Behind Tuln, a point was declared, and the crowd yelled in approval. He glanced to the side. The nobleman's sword was free again. Lon moved over to Yasna's side. Tuln, listen to reason, please. To him, this is reasonable, Yasna said as Tuln turned his back on the two. The nobleman's hilt lay exposed, inviting. I wonder how the world will survive after he gets himself killed, Yasna said. Tuln froze. That's right, the woman said. Think about that. What happens when you die, Talonel Elin? You said you needed to locate your brother Harold's. You haven't found them yet, have you? What if something happened to them? What if you're the only one left? What if something happened to them? The room grew dark, dark and red. What if you fail? Yasna asked. A room full of warriors? An entire castle's worth of soldiers? Even for the mythic soldier of the heralds, those are daunting odds. You told me that you could die. What happens to us if you do? What if you fail? Before him, two dueling warriors burst into flame. They danced, two candle-tips sparring on the floor. There was no crowd, just a rolling inferno. And the screams, horrible screams, sounding from the fires, sounding in his ears, screams of terror and pain, the sound of some poor creature being tortured beyond sanity. What if you fail? What if you fail? What if you fail? Tone spun in the fiery tempest. Lon was a blazing torch that shied back from Tuln in fear. The noblemen around Tuln were nothing more than living pyres. But her, she was unchanged. She stared at him with those eyes, eyes dense like stone. Can you risk it? she asked, so unyielding, yet so right. Behind her, the smoke of a thousand flames gathered and pooled together. Tuln could see a form moving within the vortex, a dark, shifting thing, an evil thing. It moved forward, coming for him. Curse you, woman, Tuln said, groaning, stumbling. He had to attack. He had to do something, anything. Uncertainty was the fire's gateway, and inaction its sustenance. The sword— he just had to reach for the sword. So close. If he fought, he would fail. He moaned, closing his eyes, holding his head. He clawed at his mind, casting out memories, seizing optimism, and dragging it forth. He was not alone. He would find the others. However, he had to live until he was absolutely sure that they were alive. Tuln opened his eyes, sweat dripping from his brow, and gasped quietly. He was on his knees, the crowd around him having backed away in alarm. Tuln reached up, allowing Lon to help him to his feet. Lady Yasna watched with cool eyes. She nodded once, turning to leave. I've done what you asked, Tuln said, as Lon calmed the onlookers, explaining that Tuln was having stomach pains. 
I stayed out of trouble. Yasna turned, eyebrow raised inquisitively. You still want a meeting with my brother? No, Talon said. Something else. Tomorrow I will be leaving Ral Aram. If you wish to avoid an incident, see that the guards allow me access to the oath gates. Very well, Yasna said through a thin line of a mouth. But not tomorrow. There will be too many people returning home from the dueling competition. I will send you word. Soon, Yasna, Talon said firmly. You will not leave me waiting as you did with our previously promised meeting. You have my word, Yasna said. Talon nodded, then rested a weak hand on Lon's shoulder, not caring that doing so revealed his poor clothing. Let's go he said.